we're gonna do the Federalist uh, next. I guess it's by Alexander Hamilton. That's what it says on Spotify. But Library of Congress says it was uh, published as as, as Publius. Publius. So we'll we will see about this. Um, what was I going to do before we started this? Again, I've never read any of these books as far as the American Revolution is concerned. I don't know what they say. Uh, the only thing I know about Alexander Hamilton was the duel. That's about it as far as it goes. Uh, we'll start off with magic. I feel like that's appropriate with Alexander Hamilton and the duel. We'll see how it goes from there. Um, This account isn't owned by any government. It's mine. As, uh, as we learned from the American crisis, you have the right to remain silent. Uh, I believe you have perverted the Constitution and you are being put back in your place. I'm the trusted individual it was entrusted to. Um, you're not going to cut corners here. You can do it the right way or you can do it the wrong way. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't want to see that. She has the right to remain silent. I don't know what else to tell you. I will. I don't like you. You're not good people. You don't deserve to be in that position. Um, I'm the one who was, in, who was entrusted to, not you. But again, we're going to do this. Uh, we'll start off making a deck. We'll see how that goes. Um, we're, we're doing it on Twitch today, so I can download it afterwards, just in case anything were to happen to it for safekeeping. Uh, I didn't realize on YouTube that you could not. That's frustrating. Uh, not that I distrust them, but regardless, uh, it doesn't sit well with me. I don't like that just sitting there. at all but I guess we will uh, we will start the show uh, thank you Spotify thank you uh, LibriVox community <laughs> but personally honestly uh, Spotify doesn't really I mean I guess it would draw customers but for free <laughs> yeah you're paying money for that you know what I mean I appreciate it LibriVox this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, we'll see please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kim Braun. The Federalist Papers. Federalist Number One. General Introduction. For the Independent Journal. Saturday. October 27th, 1787. Hamilton. To the people of the State of New York. After an unequivocal experience of the inefficacy of the subsisting federal government, you are called upon to deliberate on a new Constitution for the United States of America. The subject speaks its own importance, comprehending in its consequences nothing less than the existence of the Union the safety and welfare of the parts of which it is composed, the fate of an empire in many respects the most interesting in the world. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made, and a wrong election of the part we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as the general misfortune of mankind. This idea will add the inducements of philanthropy to those of patriotism, to heighten the solicitude 
which all considerate and good men must feel for the event. Happy will it be if our choice should be directed by a judicious estimate of our true interests, unperplexed and unbiased by considerations not connected with the public good. But this is a thing more ardently to be wished than seriously to be expected. The plan offered to our deliberations affects too many particular interests, innovates upon too many local institutions, not to involve in its discussion a variety of objects foreign to its merits, and of views, passions, and prejudices literal favorable to the discovery of truth. Among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new Constitution will have to encounter may readily be distinguished the obvious interest of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution of the power, emolument, and consequence of the offices they hold under the state establishments, and the perverted ambition of another class of men, who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by the confusions of their country, or will flatter themselves with fairer prospects of elevation from the subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies than from its union under one government. It is not, however, my design to dwell upon observations of this nature. I am well aware that it would be disingenuous to resolve indiscriminately the opposition of any set of men, merely because their situations might subject them to suspicion, into interested or ambitious views. Candor will oblige us to admit that even such men may be actuated by upright intentions, and it cannot be doubted that much of the opposition which has made its appearance, or may hereafter make its appearance, will spring from sources, blameless at least, if not respectable. The honest errors of minds led astray by preconceived jealousies and fears. So numerous indeed, and so powerful, are the causes which serve to give a false bias to the judgment that we, upon many occasions, see wise and good men on the wrong as well as on the right side of questions of the first magnitude to society. This circumstance, if duly attended to, would furnish a lesson of moderation to those who are ever so much persuaded of their being in the right in any controversy. And a further reason for caution in this respect might be drawn from the reflection that we are not always sure that those who advocate the truth are influenced by purer principles than their antagonists. Ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these, are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Were there not even these inducements to moderation, nothing could be more ill-judged than that intolerant spirit which has, at all times, characterized political parties. For in politics, as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. And yet, however just these sentiments will be allowed to be, we have already sufficient indications that it will happen in this as in all former cases of great national discussion. A torrent of angry and malignant passions will be let loose. To judge from the conduct of the opposite parties, we shall be led to conclude that they will mutually hope to evince the justness of their opinions, and to increase the number of their converts, by the loudness of their declamations and the bitterness of their invectives an enlightened zeal for the energy and efficiency of government will be stigmatized as the offspring of a temper fond of despotic power and hostile to the principles of liberty. An over-scrupulous jealousy of danger to the rights of the people, which is more commonly the fault of the head than of the heart, will be represented as mere pretense and artifice, the stale bait for popularity at the expense of the public good. It will be forgotten, on the one hand, that jealousy is the usual concomitant of love, and that the noble enthusiasm of liberty is apt to be infected with a spirit of narrow and illiberal distrust. On the other hand, it will be equally forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, that, in the contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interest can never be separated and that a dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the specious mask of zeal for the rights of the people than under the forbidden appearance of zeal for the firmness and efficiency of government. 
history will teach us that the former has been found a much more certain road to the introduction of despotism than the latter and that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people commencing demagogues and ending tyrants in the course of the preceding observations i have had an eye my fellow-citizens to putting you upon your guard against all attempts from whatever quarter to influence your decision in a matter of the utmost moment to your welfare by any impressions other than those which may result from the evidence of truth you will no doubt at the same time have collected from the general scope of them that they proceed from a source not unfriendly to the new constitution yes my countrymen i own to you that after having given it an attentive consideration I am clearly of opinion it is your interest to adopt it. I am convinced that this is the safest course for your liberty, your dignity, and your happiness. I affect not reserves which I do not feel. I will not amuse you with an appearance of deliberation when I have decided. I frankly acknowledge to you my convictions, and I will freely lay before you the reasons on which they are founded. The consciousness of good intentions disdains ambiguity. I shall not, however, multiply professions on this head. My motives must remain in the depository of my own breast. My arguments will be open to all, and may be judged of by all. They shall at least be offered in a spirit which will not disgrace the cause of truth. I propose, in a series of papers, to discuss the following interesting particulars. The utility of the Union to your political prosperity the insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve that union, the necessity of a government at least equally energetic with the one proposed to the attainment of this object, the conformity of the proposed constitution to the true principles of republican government, its analogy to your own state constitution, and lastly, the additional security which its adoption will afford to the preservation of that species of government, to liberty and to property. In the progress of this discussion I shall endeavor to give a satisfactory answer to all the objections which shall have made their appearance, that may seem to have any claim to your attention. It may perhaps be thought superfluous to offer arguments to prove the utility of the Union, a point, no doubt, deeply engraved on the hearts of the great body of the people in every state, and one, which it may be imagined, has no adversaries. But the fact is that we already hear it whispered in the private circles of those who oppose the new Constitution, that the thirteen states are of too great extent for any general system, and that we must, of necessity, resort to separate confederacies of distinct portions of the whole. Footnote. The same idea, tracing the arguments to their consequences, is held out in several of the late publications against the new Constitution. End of footnote. This doctrine will, in all probability, be gradually propagated, till it has votaries enough to countenance an open avowal of it. For nothing can be more evident, to those who are able to take an enlarged view of the subject, than the alternative of an adoption of the new Constitution or a dismemberment of the Union. It will therefore be of use to begin by examining the advantages of that Union, the certain evils and the probable dangers to which every State will be exposed from its dissolution. This shall accordingly constitute the subject of my next address. Publius End of Federalist Number 1「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kim Braun. The Federalist Papers. Federalist Number 2. Concerning Dangers from Foreign Force and Influence. For the Independent Journal. Wednesday, October 31st, 1787. J. 
to the people of the state of New York. When the people of America reflect that they are now called upon to decide a question which, in its consequences, must prove one of the most important that ever engaged their attention, the propriety of their taking a very comprehensive, as well as a very serious, view of it, will be evident. Nothing is more certain than the indispensable necessity of government, and it is equally undeniable that whenever and however it is instituted, the people must cede to it some of their natural rights in order to vest it with requisite powers. It is well worthy of consideration, therefore, whether it would conduce more to the interest of the people of America that they should, to all general purposes, be one nation under one federal government, or that they should divide themselves into separate confederacies, and give to the head of each the same kind of powers which they are advised to place in one national government. It has until lately been a received and uncontradicted opinion that the prosperity of the people of America depended on their continuing firmly united, and the wishes, prayers, and efforts of our best and wisest citizens have been constantly directed to that object. But politicians now appear, who insist that this opinion is erroneous, and that instead of looking for safety and happiness in union, we ought to seek it in a division of the states into distinct confederacies or sovereignties. However extraordinary this new doctrine may appear, it nevertheless has its advocates, and certain characters who were much opposed to it formerly are at present of the number. Whatever may be the arguments or inducements which have wrought this change in the sentiments and declarations of these gentlemen, it certainly would not be wise in the people at large to adopt these new political tenets without being fully convinced that they are founded in truth and sound policy. It has often given me pleasure to observe that independent America was not composed of detached and distant territories, but that one connected, fertile, wide-spreading country was the portion of our western sons of liberty. Providence has in a particular manner blessed it with a variety of soils and productions, and watered it with innumerable streams for the delight and accommodation of its inhabitants. A succession of navigable waters forms a kind of chain round its borders, as if to bind it together, while the most noble rivers in the world, running at convenient distances, present them with highways for the easy communication of friendly aids and the mutual transportation and exchange of their various commodities. With equal pleasure I have as often taken notice that Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs, and who, by their joint councils, arms, and efforts, fighting side by side throughout a long and bloody war, have nobly established general liberty and independence. This country and this people seem to have been made for each other, and it appears as if it was the design of Providence, that an inheritance so proper and convenient for a band of brethren, united to each other by the strongest ties, should never be split into a number of unsocial, jealous, and alien sovereignties. Similar sentiments have hitherto prevailed among all orders and denominations of men among us. To all general purposes we have uniformly been one people, each individual citizen everywhere, enjoying the same national rights, privileges, and protection. As a nation, we have made peace and war. As a nation, we have vanquished our common enemies. As a nation, we have formed alliances and made treaties and entered into various compacts and conventions with foreign states. A strong sense of the value and blessings of union induced the people, at a very early period, to institute a federal government to preserve and perpetuate it. They formed it almost as soon as they had a political existence, nay, at a time when their habitations were in flames, when many of their citizens were bleeding, and when the progress of hostility and desolation left little room for those calm and mature inquiries and reflections which must ever precede the formation 
of a wise and well-balanced government for a free people. It is not to be wondered at that a government instituted in times so inauspicious should, on experiment, be found greatly deficient and inadequate to the purpose it was intended to answer. This intelligent people perceived and regretted these defects. Still continuing no less attached to union than enamored of liberty, they observed the danger which immediately threatened the former and more remotely the latter, and being persuaded that ample security for both could only be found in a national government more wisely framed, they as with one voice convened the late convention at Philadelphia to take that important subject under consideration. This convention, composed of men who possessed the confidence of the people, and many of whom had become highly distinguished by their patriotism, virtue, and wisdom, in times which tried the minds and hearts of men, undertook the arduous task. In the mild season of peace, with minds unoccupied by other subjects, they passed many months in cool, uninterrupted, and daily consultation, and finally, without having been awed by power or influenced by any passions except love for their country, they presented and recommended to the people the plan produced by their joint and very unanimous councils. Admit, for so is the fact, that this plan is only recommended, not imposed, yet let it be remembered that it is neither recommended to blind approbation nor to blind reprobation but to that sedate and candid consideration which the magnitude and importance of the subject demand, and which it certainly ought to receive. But this, as was remarked in the foregoing number of this paper, is more to be wished than expected, that it may be so considered and examined. Experience on a former occasion teaches us not to be too sanguine in such hopes. It is not yet forgotten that well-grounded apprehensions of imminent danger induced the people of America to form the memorable Congress of 1774. That body recommended certain measures to their constituents, and the event proved their wisdom. Yet it is fresh in our memories how soon the press began to teem with pamphlets and weekly papers against those very measures. Not only many of the officers of a government, who obeyed the dictates of personal interest, but others from a mistaken estimate of consequences or the undue influence of former attachments, or whose ambition aimed at objects which did not correspond with the public good, were indefatigable in their efforts to persuade the people to reject the advice of that patriotic Congress. Many, indeed, were deceived and deluded, but the great majority of the people reasoned and decided judiciously, and happy they are in reflecting that they did so. They considered that the Congress was composed of many wise and experienced men, that, being convened from different parts of the country, they brought with them and communicated to each other a variety of useful information, that, in the course of the time they passed together in inquiring into and discussing the true interests of their country, they must have acquired very accurate knowledge on that head that they were individually interested in the public liberty and prosperity, and therefore that it was not less their inclination than their duty to recommend only such measures as, after the most mature deliberation, they really thought prudent and advisable. These and similar considerations then induced the people to rely greatly on the judgment and integrity of the Congress, and they took their advice, notwithstanding the various arts and endeavors used to deter them from it. But if the people at large had reason to confide in the men of that Congress, few of whom had been fully tried or generally known, still greater reason have they now to respect the judgment and advice of the Convention, for it is well known that some of the most distinguished members of that Congress, who have been since tried and justly approved for patriotism and abilities, and who have grown old in acquiring political information, were also members of this convention, and carried into it their accumulated knowledge and experience. It is worthy of remark that not only the first, but every succeeding Congress, as well as the late convention, have invariably joined with the people in thinking that the prosperity of America depended on its union. 
to preserve and perpetuate it was the great object of the people in forming that convention and it is also the great object of the plan which the convention has advised them to adopt with what propriety therefore or for what good purposes are attempts at this particular period made by some men to depreciate the importance of the union or why is it suggested that three or four confederacies would be better than one i am persuaded in my own mind that the people have always thought right on this subject and that their universal and uniform attachment to the cause of the union rests on great and weighty reasons which i shall endeavor to develop and explain in some ensuing papers they who promote the idea of substituting a number of distinct confederacies in the room of the plan of the convention seem clearly to foresee that the rejection of it would put the continuance of the union in the utmost jeopardy that certainly would be the case and i sincerely wish that it may Perverted. be as clearly foreseen by every good citizen that whenever the dissolution of the union arrives america will have reason to exclaim in the words of the poet farewell a long farewell to all my greatness publius end of federalist number two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kim Braun. The Federalist Papers. Federalist Number 3. The same subject continued, concerning dangers from foreign force and influence. For the Independent Journal. Saturday. November 3rd, 1787. J. To the people of the State of New York. It is not a new observation that the people of any country, if, like the Americans, intelligent and well-informed, seldom adopt and steadily persevere for many years in an erroneous opinion respecting their interests. That consideration naturally tends to create great respect for the high opinion which the people of America have so long and uniformly entertained of the importance of their continuing firmly united under one federal government, vested with sufficient powers for all general and national purposes. The more attentively I consider and investigate the reasons which appear to have given birth to this opinion, the more I become convinced that they are cogent and conclusive. Among the many objects yep. to which a wise and free people find you it are. necessary to direct their attention, here, that here. of providing for their safety seems to be the first. The safety of the people doubtless has relation to a great variety of circumstances and considerations, and consequently affords great latitude to those who wish to define it precisely and comprehensively. At present I mean only to consider it as it respects security for the preservation of peace and tranquillity, as well as against dangers from foreign arms and influence, as from dangers of the like kind arising from domestic causes. As the former of these comes first in order, it is proper it should be the first discussed. Let us therefore proceed to examine whether the people are not right in their opinion that a cordial union under an efficient national government, affords them the best security that can be devised against hostilities from abroad. The number of wars which have happened or will happen in the world will always be found to be in proportion to the number and weight of the causes, whether real or pretended, which provoke or invite them. If this remark be just, it becomes useful to inquire whether so many just causes of war are likely to be given by united america as by disunited america for if it should turn out that united america will probably give the fewest then it will follow that in this respect the union tends most to preserve the people in a state of peace with other nations the just causes of war for the most part 
arise either from violation of treaties or from direct violence. America has already formed treaties with no less than six foreign nations, and all of them, except Prussia. You remember that cannon he was talking about? As you drive by and vibrate intentionally, you're assaulting me. Stop. I will kill you. Are maritime, and therefore able to annoy and injure us. She has also extensive commerce with Portugal, Spain, and Britain, and with respect to the two latter, has, play in addition, the, the circumstance of neighborhood to, to attend back. to. It is of high importance to the peace of America that she observe the laws of nations towards all these powers, and to me it appears evident that this will be more perfectly and punctually done by one boy. national government than it could be either by thirteen separate states or by three or four distinct confederacies. Because when once an efficient national government is established, the best men in the country will not only consent to serve, but also will generally be appointed to manage it. For, although town or country or other contracted influence may place men in state assemblies or senates or courts of justice or executive departments, yet more general and extensive reputation for talents and other qualifications will be necessary to recommend men to offices under the national government, especially as it will have the widest field for choice and never experience that want of proper persons which is not uncommon in some of the states. Hence, it will result that the administration, the political councils, and the judicial decisions of the national government will be more wise, systematical, and judicious than those of individual states, and consequently more satisfactory with respect to other nations, as well as more safe with respect to us. Because, under the national government, treaties and articles of treaties, as well as the laws of nations, will always be expounded in one sense and executed in the same manner, whereas adjudications on the same points and questions in thirteen states or in three or four confederacies will not always accord or be consistent, and that, as well from the variety of independent courts and judges appointed by different and independent governments, as from the different local laws and interests which may affect and influence them. The wisdom of the Convention in committing such questions to the jurisdiction and judgment of courts appointed by, and responsible only to, one national government, cannot be too much commended. Because the prospect of present loss or advantage may often tempt the governing party in one or two states to swerve from good faith and justice. But those temptations, not reaching the other states, and consequently having little or no influence on the national government, the temptation will be fruitless, and good faith and justice be preserved. The case of the Treaty of Peace with Britain adds great weight to this reasoning. Because even if the governing party in a state should be disposed to resist such temptations, Yet as such temptations may, and commonly do, result from circumstances peculiar to the state, and may affect a great number of the inhabitants, the governing party may not always be able, if willing, to prevent the injustice meditated or to punish the aggressors. That's premeditated. But the I'll, national I'll government, not being affected by those local circumstances, will neither be induced to commit the wrong themselves nor want power or inclination to prevent or punish its commission by others. Nope, I want to be left alone. So far, therefore, as either designed or accidental violation of treaties and the laws of nations afford just cause of war, this stupid ass fucking they are less around. to be apprehended under one general government person, than under several lesser ones, and in that respect, the, the former most favors the safety of here. the people. As to those just causes of war which proceed from direct and unlawful violence, it appears equally clear to me that one good national government, 
affords vastly more security against dangers of that sort than can be derived from any other quarter. Because such violences are more frequently caused by the passions and interests of a part than of the whole, of one or two states than of the Union. Not a single Indian war has yet been occasioned by aggressions of the present federal government, feeble as it is. But there are several instances of Indian hostilities having been provoked by the improper conduct of individual states, who, either unable or unwilling to restrain or punish offenses, have given occasion to the slaughter of many innocent inhabitants. The neighborhood of Spanish and British territories, bordering on some states and not on others, naturally confines the causes of quarrel more immediately to the borderers. The bordering states, if any, will be those who, under the impulse of sudden irritation and a quick sense of apparent interest or injury, nah, gonna, will be random, most likely, by direct violence, to excite war with these nations, and nothing can so effectually obviate that danger as a the, national uh, government whose wisdom and prudence bug, will not be diminished by the passions card, which actuate like, like the parties said, immediately person, interested. Right here, you're but not only fewer just causes of war will be given by the you're national government, the right but it there. will also be more in their power to accommodate and settle them amicably. They will be more temperate and cool, and in that respect, as well as in others, will be more in capacity to act advisedly than the offending state. The pride of states, as well as of men, naturally disposes them to justify all their actions, and opposes their acknowledging, correcting, or repairing their errors and offenses. The national government, in such cases, will not be affected by this pride, but will proceed with moderation and candor to consider and decide on the means most proper to extricate them from the difficulties which threaten them. Besides, it is well known that acknowledgments, explanations, and compensations are often accepted as satisfactory from a strong united nation, which would be rejected as unsatisfactory if offered by a state or confederacy of little consideration or power. In the year 1685, the state of Genoa, having offended Louis XIV, endeavored to appease him. He demanded that they should send their doge or chief magistrate, accompanied by four of their senators, to France, to ask his pardon and receive his terms. They were obliged to submit to it for the sake of peace. Would he, on any occasion, either have demanded or have received the like humiliation from Spain or Britain or any other powerful nation? Publius End of Federalist Number 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kim Braun the Federalist Papers Federalist Number 4 The same subject continued, concerning dangers from foreign force and influence. For the Independent Journal Wednesday, November 7, 1787 J. To the People of the State of New York my last paper assigned several reasons why the safety of the people would be best secured by union against the danger it may be exposed to by just causes of war given to other nations, and those reasons show that such causes would not only be more rarely given, but would also be more easily accommodated by a national government than either by the state governments or the proposed little confederacies. But the safety of the people of America against dangers from foreign force depends not only on their forbearing to give just causes of war to other nations, but also on their placing and continuing themselves in such a situation as not to invite hostility or insult, 
for it need not be observed that there are pretended as well as just causes of war. It is too true, however disgraceful it may be to human nature, that nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it. Nay, absolute monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it, but for the purposes and objects merely personal, such as thirst for military glory, revenge for personal affronts, ambition, or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans. These, and a variety of other motives, which affect only the mind of the sovereign, often lead him to engage in wars not sanctified by justice or the voice and interests of his people. But, independent of these inducements to war, which are more prevalent in absolute monarchies, but which well deserve our attention, there are others which affect nations as often as kings, and some of them will on examination be found to grow out of our relative situation and circumstances. With France and with Britain we are rivals in the fisheries, and can supply their markets cheaper than they can themselves, notwithstanding any efforts to prevent it by bounties on their own or duties on foreign fish. With them and with most other European nations we are rivals in navigation and the carrying trade, and we shall deceive ourselves if we suppose that any of them will rejoice to see it flourish. For, as our carrying trade cannot increase without in some degree diminishing theirs, it is more their interest, and will be more their policy, to restrain than to promote it. In the trade to China and India, we interfere with more than one nation, inasmuch as it enables us to partake in advantages which they had in a manner monopolized, and as we thereby supply ourselves with commodities which we used to purchase from them. The extension of our own commerce and our own vessels cannot give pleasure to any nations who possess territories on or near this continent, because the cheapness and excellence of our productions, added to the circumstance of vicinity, and the enterprise and address of our merchants and navigators, will give us a greater share in the advantages which those territories afford than consists with the wishes or policy of their respective sovereigns. Spain thinks it convenient to shut the Mississippi against us on the one side, and Britain excludes us from the St. Lawrence on the other. Nor will either of them permit the other waters which are between them and us to become the means of mutual intercourse and traffic. From these and such like considerations, which might, if consistent with prudence, be more amplified and detailed, it is easy to see that jealousies and uneasiness may gradually slide into the minds and cabinets of other nations, and that we are not to expect that they should regard our advancement in union, in power, and consequence by land and by sea, with an eye of indifference and composure. The people of America are aware that inducements to war may arise out of these circumstances, as well as from others not so obvious at present, and that whenever such inducements may find fit time and opportunity for operation, pretenses to color and justify them will not be wanting. Wisely, therefore, do they consider union and a good national government as necessary to put and keep them in such a situation, as, instead of inviting war, will tend to repress and discourage it. That situation consists in the best possible state of defense, and necessarily depends on the government, the arms, and the resources of the country. As the safety of the whole is the interest of the whole, and cannot be provided for without government, either one or more or many, let us inquire whether one good government is not, relative to the object in question, more competent than any other given number whatever. One government can collect and avail itself of the talents and experience of the ablest men, in whatever part of the Union they may be found. It can move on uniform principles of policy. It can harmonize, assimilate, and protect the several parts and members, and extend the benefit of its foresight and precautions to each. In the formation of treaties, it will regard the interest of the whole, and the particular interests of the parts as connected with that of the whole. 
it can apply the resources and power of the whole to the defense of any particular part, and that more easily and expeditiously than state governments or separate confederacies can possibly do, for want of concert and unity of system. It can place the militia under one plan of discipline, and by putting their officers in a proper line of subordination to the chief magistrate, will, as it were, consolidate them into one corps, and thereby render them more efficient than if divided into thirteen or into three or four distinct independent companies. What would the militia of Britain be if the English militia obeyed the government of England, if the Scotch militia obeyed the government of Scotland, and if the Welsh militia obeyed the government of Wales? Suppose an invasion. Would those three governments, if they agreed at all, be able, with all their respective forces, to operate against the enemy so effectually as the single government of Great Britain would? We have heard much of the fleets of Britain, and the time may come, if we are wise, when the fleets of America may engage attention. But if one national government had not so regulated the navigation of Britain as to make it a nursery for seamen, if one national government had not called forth all the national means and materials for forming fleets, their prowess and their thunder would never have been celebrated. Let England have its navigation and fleet. Let Scotland have its navigation and fleet. Let Wales have its navigation and fleet. Let Ireland have its navigation and fleet. Let those four of the constituent parts of the British Empire be under four independent governments, and it is easy to perceive how soon they would each dwindle into comparative insignificance. Apply these facts to our own case. Leave America divided into thirteen, or, if you please, into three or four independent governments. What armies could they raise and pay? What fleets could they ever hope to have? If one was attacked, would the others fly to its succor and spend their blood and money in its defense? Would there be no danger of their being flattered into neutrality by its specious promises, or seduced by a too great fondness for peace to decline hazarding their tranquillity and present safety for the sake of neighbors, of whom perhaps they have been jealous, and whose importance they are content to see diminished? Although such conduct would not be wise, it would, nevertheless, be natural. The history of the states of Greece and of other countries abounds with such instances, and it is not improbable that what has so often happened would, under similar circumstances, happen again. But admit that they might be willing to help the invaded state or confederacy. How, and when, and in what proportion, shall aids of men and money be afforded? Who shall command the allied armies, and from which of them shall he receive his orders? Who shall settle the terms of peace? and in case of disputes what umpire shall decide between them and compel acquiescence. Various difficulties and inconveniences would be inseparable from such a situation, whereas one government, watching over the general and common interests, and combining and directing the powers and resources of the whole, would be free from all these embarrassments, and conduce far more to the safety of the people. But whatever may be our situation, whether firmly united under one national government, or split into a number of confederacies, certain it is that foreign nations will know and view it exactly as it is, and they will act toward us accordingly. If they see that our national government is efficient and well administered, our trade prudently regulated, our militia properly organized and disciplined, our resources and finances discreetly managed, our credit re-established, our people free, contented, and united, they will be much more disposed to cultivate our friendship than provoke our resentment. If, on the other hand, they find us either destitute of an effectual government, each state doing right or wrong as to its rulers may seem convenient, or split into three or four independent and probably discordant republics or confederacies, one inclining to Britain, another to France, and a third to Spain, and perhaps played off against each other by the three, what a poor, pitiful figure will America make in their eyes! How liable would she become, not only to their contempt, but to their outrage, 
and how soon would dear-bought experience proclaim that when a people or family so divide it never fails to be against themselves publius end of federalist number four This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kim Braun. The Federalist Papers. Federalist Number 5. The same subject continued. Concerning dangers from foreign force and influence. For the Independent Journal, Saturday, November 10th, 1787. J. To the People of the State of New York. Queen Anne, in her letter of the 1st July, 1706, to the Scotch Parliament, makes some observations on the importance of the union then forming between England and Scotland, which merit our attention. I shall present the public with one or two extracts from it. An entire and perfect union will be the solid foundation of lasting peace. It will secure your religion, liberty, and property. Remove the animosities amongst yourselves, and the jealousies and differences betwixt our two kingdoms. It must increase your strength, riches, and trade, and by this union the whole island, being joined in affection and free from all apprehensions of different interest, will be enabled to resist all its enemies. We most earnestly recommend to you calmness and unanimity in this great and weighty affair, that the Union may be brought to a happy conclusion, being the only effectual way to secure our present and future happiness, and disappoint the designs of our and your enemies, who will doubtless, on this occasion, use their utmost endeavors to prevent or delay this Union. It was remarked in the preceding paper that weakness and divisions at home would invite dangers from abroad, and that nothing would tend more to secure us from them than union, strength, and good government within ourselves. This subject is copious and cannot easily be exhausted. The history of Great Britain is the one with which we are in general the best acquainted, and it gives us many useful lessons we may profit by their experience without paying the price which it cost them. Although it seems obvious to common sense that the people of such an island should be but one nation, yet we find that they were for ages divided into three, and that those three were almost constantly embroiled in quarrels and wars with one another. Notwithstanding, their true interest with respect to the continental nations was really the same, Yet by the arts and policy and practices of those nations, their mutual jealousies were perpetually kept inflamed, and for a long series of years they were far more inconvenient and troublesome than they were useful and assisting to each other. Should the people of America divide themselves into three or four nations, would not the same thing happen? Would not similar jealousies arise and be in like manner cherished? Instead of their being joined in affection and free from all apprehension of different interests, envy and jealousy would soon extinguish confidence and affection, and the partial interests of each confederacy, instead of the general interests of all America, would be the only objects of their policy and pursuits. Hence, like most other bordering nations, they would always be either involved in disputes and war, or live in the constant apprehension of them. The most sanguine advocates for three or four confederacies cannot reasonably suppose that they would long remain exactly on an equal footing in point of strength, even if it was possible to form them so at first. But, admitting that to be practicable, yet what human contrivance can secure the continuance of such equality? independent of those local circumstances which tend to beget and increase power in one part and to impede its progress in another, 
We must advert to the effects of that superior policy and good management, which would probably distinguish the government of one above the rest, and by which their relative equality and strength and consideration would be destroyed. For it cannot be presumed that the same degree of sound policy, prudence, and foresight would uniformly be observed by each of these confederacies for a long succession of years. Whenever and from whatever causes it might happen, and happen it would, that any of these nations or confederacies should rise on the scale of political importance much above the degree of her neighbors, that moment would those neighbors behold her with envy and with fear. Both those passions would lead them to countenance, if not to promote, whatever might promise to diminish her importance, and would also restrain them from measures calculated to advance or even to secure her prosperity. Much time would not be necessary to enable her to discern these unfriendly dispositions. She would soon begin not only to lose confidence in her neighbors, but also to feel a disposition equally unfavorable to them. Distrust naturally creates distrust, and by nothing is good will and kind conduct more speedily changed than by invidious jealousies and uncandid imputations, whether expressed or implied. The North is generally the region of strength, and many local circumstances render it probable that the most northern of the proposed confederacies would, at a period not very distant, be unquestionably more formidable than any of the others. No sooner would this become evident than the northern hive would excite the same ideas and sensations in the more southern parts of America which it formerly did in the southern parts of Europe. Nor does it appear to be a rash conjecture that its young swarms might often be tempted to gather honey in the more blooming fields and milder air of their luxurious and more delicate neighbors. They who well consider the history of similar divisions and confederacies will find abundant reason to apprehend that those in contemplation would in no other sense be neighbors than as they would be borderers, that they would neither love nor trust one another, but on the contrary would be a prey to discord, jealousy, and mutual injuries. In short, that they would place us exactly in the situations in which other nations doubtless wish to see us, viz. formidable only to each other. From these considerations it appears that those gentlemen are greatly mistaken who suppose that alliances offensive and defensive might be formed between these confederacies, and would produce that combination and union of wills of arms and of resources which would be necessary to put and keep them in a formidable state of defense against foreign enemies. When did the independent states into which Britain and Spain were formerly divided? Combine. I mean, it's it's the beginning. They're uh they're fresh. They're talking about defenses right now. They're fresh. That pizza bum. Let's see what they have to say about that. You're confused. I have walls. I have an address. I'm I'm the Federalist right now, and you're you're doing stupid stuff like this. It's it's not a joke. You have the right to remain. I could kill you right now, and you're making jokes. It, it doesn't fit well. And in such alliance, or unite their forces against a foreign enemy. The proposed confederacies will be distinct nations. Each of them would have its commerce with foreigners to regulate by distinct treaties. And as their productions and commodities are different and proper for different markets, so would those treaties be essentially different. Different commercial concerns must create different treaties, and of course different degrees of political attachment to and connection with different foreign nations. Hence it might and probably would happen that the foreign nation with whom the Southern Confederacy might be at war would be the one with whom the Northern Confederacy would be the most desirous of preserving peace and friendship. 
An alliance so contrary no. to their immediate interest would not therefore be easy to form, nor, if formed, would it be observed and fulfilled with perfect good faith. I don't Nay, appreciate that. That's a bad it light. is far more probable that in America, as in Europe, neighboring nations, acting under the impulse of opposite interests and unfriendly passions, would frequently be found taking different sides. Considering our distance from Europe, it would be more natural for these confederacies to apprehend danger from one another than from distant nations, You're being apprehended. and therefore that each of them should be more desirous to guard against the others by the aid of foreign alliances than to guard against foreign dangers by alliances between themselves. And here let us not forget how much more easy it is to receive foreign fleets into our ports and foreign armies into our country than it is to persuade or compel them to depart. I'm gonna wait a minute. Now you're gonna. How many me conquests off. did the Romans and others make in the characters of allies, and what innovations did they, under the same character, introduce into the governments of those whom they pretended to protect? Not a matter of king. Let you candid broke the men law judge then whether the division of America into I, I any given it, number of independent right sovereignties not only you're would tend to secure us by, against by the hostilities and improper interference of foreign nations. It's improper. Publius. End of Federalist number five. I don't mind, you know, trying hard and playing, but the presence of someone... This is a LibriVox recording. All me. LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Side. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The, the Federalist Papers, Federalist No. 6, by Furthermore, Alexander Hamilton. Like, Concerning the dangers from dissensions it. between the Stop states, the Hamilton, to, to the people of the state of New York. The three last numbers of this paper have been dedicated to an enumeration of the dangers to which we should be exposed in a state of disunion from the arms and arts of foreign nations. I shall now proceed to delineate dangers of a different and, perhaps, still more alarming kind, those which will in all probability flow from dissensions between the states themselves and from domestic factions and convulsions. These have been already, in some instances, slightly anticipated, but they deserve a more particular and more full investigation. A man must be far gone in utopian speculations who can seriously doubt that, if these states should either be wholly disunited or only united in partial confederacies, the subdivisions into which they might be thrown would have frequent and violent contests with each other. To presume a want of motives for such contests as an argument against their existence would be to forget that men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious. To look for a continuation of harmony between a number of independent, unconnected sovereignties in the same neighborhood would be to disregard the uniform course of human events and to set at defiance the accumulated experience of ages. The causes of hostility among nations are innumerable. There are some which have a general and almost constant operation upon the collective bodies of society. Of this description are the love of power, or the desire of preeminence and dominion, the jealousy of power, or the desire of equality and safety. There are others which have a more circumscribed, though an equally operative influence within their spheres. Such are the rivalships and competitions of commerce between commercial nations. And there are others, not less numerous than either of the former, which take their origin entirely in private passions in the attachments, enmities, interests, hopes, and fears of leading individuals in the communities of which they are members. Men of this class, whether the favorites of a king or of a people, have in too many instances abused the confidence they possessed, and, assuming the pretext of some public motive, have not scrupled to sacrifice the national tranquility to personal advantage or personal gratification. The celebrated Pericles, in compliance with the resentment of a prostitute, that's what I'm talking footnote, about. They're cheating. Aspasia, the after, Plutarch's Life a, of Pericles, end footnote. The celebrated now Pericles, in compliance with the resentment of a prostitute, at the expense of much of the blood and treasure okay. of his countrymen, I'm attacked, right vanquished, there, okay. and destroyed the city. So, officers, Chris, I'm really not kidding with you. 
I've been given permission. I will do it. So either you can fix the algorithm or I will fix you. I'm starting to get pissed. Again, I don't care that you win. I don't care that you try hard. Quit cheating. I'm not kidding. I don't care. The brotherhood, this isn't, this isn't Cain and Abel. Try a step above. Try the guy that told him off. That stupid bitch, she's gone. Like, I'm about to take you over. I've been given permission. It doesn't matter who you are. You are that bad. So, again, I don't mind if, if a, a deck that comes in and whoops my ass. I don't mind that. Uh, the algorithm. I'm not kidding with you. It's hostile. It's violent. Stop doing it. That bot is an extension of your, your own personal body, is your own personal mind. It's, it's violent. Stop doing it. I'm not kidding with you. It's magic. It's a game. I don't really care. Your algorithm. Stop or I will. That applies to Cindy as well. Hasbro, I'm not kidding with you. You're a bunch of frauds. I will do something about it. Either you can fix it or I will. End of discussion. I'm not kidding. ...of the Samnians. The same man, stimulated by private peak against the Megarensians, footnote, Ibid Aspasia. End footnote. The same man, stimulated by private pique against the Megarensians, another nation of Greece, or to avoid a prosecution with which he was threatened as an accomplice of a supposed theft of the statuary Phidias, footnote, Ibid, Aspasia, end footnote, or to avoid a prosecution with which he was threatened as an accomplice of a supposed theft of the statuary Phidias, or to get rid of the accusations prepared to be brought against him for dissipating the funds of the state in the purchase of popularity. Footnote. Ibid. Phidias was supposed to have stolen some public gold, with the connivance of Pericles, for the embellishment of the statue of Minerva. End footnote. Or to get rid of the accusations prepared to be brought against him for dissipating the funds of the state in the purchase of popularity, or from a combination of all these causes, was the primitive author of that famous and fatal war, distinguished in the Grecian annals by the name of the Peloponnesian War, which, after various vicissitudes, intermissions, and renewals, terminated in the ruin of the Athenian commonwealth. The ambitious cardinal, who was prime minister to Henry VIII, permitting his vanity to aspire to the triple crown, footnote, worn by the popes, end footnote. The ambitious cardinal, who was prime minister to Henry VIII, permitting his vanity to aspire to the triple crown, entertained hopes of succeeding in the acquisition of that splendid prize by the influence of the Emperor Charles V. To secure the favor and interest of this enterprising and powerful monarch, he precipitated the... He's basically saying, like, you're, you're trying to, uh... It's not yours. The gold? It's not yours. It's, it's not public. Is what he was saying. Officers. You are the next step. I will. If you don't remove yourselves, I will. I'm sick of your shit. You are the fucking problem. Went into a war with France, contrary to the plainest dictates of policy, and at the hazard of the safety and independence, as well of the kingdom over which he presided by his councils, as of Europe in general. 
For if there ever was a sovereign who bid fair to realize the project of universal monarchy, it was the, the Emperor Charles V, of whose intrigues Wolsey was at once the instrument and the dupe. The influence which the bigotry of one female, footnote, Madame de Maintenon, and footnote, the influence which the bigotry of one female, the petulance of another, footnote, Duchess of Marlborough, and footnote, the influence which the bigotry of one female, the petulance of another, and the cabals of a third, footnote, Madame de Pompadour, and footnote, the influence which the bigotry of one female, the petulance of another, and the cabals of a third, had in the contemporary policy, ferments, and pacifications of a considerable part of Europe, are topics that have been too often descanted upon not to be generally known. To multiply examples of the agency of personal considerations in the production of great national events, either foreign or domestic, according to their direction, would be an unnecessary waste of time. He Those who have but a superficial acquaintance officer. with the sources from which they are to be drawn will themselves recollect a variety of instances, and those who have a tolerable knowledge of human nature will not stand in need of such lights to form their opinion either of the reality or extent of that agency. Perhaps, however, a reference tending to illustrate the general principle You're may with propriety be made to a case which has lately happened among ourselves. If Shays had not been a desperate debtor, it is much to be doubted whether Massachusetts would have been plunged into a civil war. But, notwithstanding the concurring testimony of experience, in this particular there are still to be found visionary or designing men who stand ready to advocate the paradox of perpetual peace between the states, though dismembered and alienated from each other. The genius of republics... He just told you your crimes, you're alienating me from other people. They're refusing to reach out. Officer... Either you can remove yourself on your own, or I will shoot you dead in the street. You, he just called you a domestic terrorist. The label's there. You're talking about the, the founders of the country. That is who you are. Terrorists. All of you. Either you can do it on your own, or I will do it for you. You understand? You have the right to remain silent. War, no war. I don't give a fuck. I'm not kidding with you. I'm really not. So eat, remove yourself. I'll give you some time. Now. Congress. Now. Go ahead and make a deck. We'll do one more deck say they, is pacific. The spirit of commerce has a tendency to soften the manners of men, and to extinguish those inflammable humors which have so often kindled into wars. Commercial republics, like ours, will never be disposed to waste themselves in ruinous contentions with each other. They will be governed by mutual interest, and will cultivate a spirit of mutual amity and concord. Is it not, we may ask these projectors in politics, the true interest of all nations to cultivate the same benevolent and philosophic spirit? If this be their true interest, have they in fact pursued it? Has it not, on the contrary, invariably been found that momentary passions and immediate interest have a more active and imperious control over human conduct than general or remote considerations of policy, utility, or justice? Have republics in practice been less addicted to war than monarchies? Are not the former administered by men as well as the latter? Are there not aversions, predilections, rivalships, and desires of unjust acquisitions that affect nations as well as kings? Are not popular assemblies frequently subject to the impulses of rage, resentment, jealousy, avarice, and of other irregular and violent propensities? Is it not well known that their determinations are often governed by a few individuals in whom they place confidence, and are, of course, liable to be tinctured by the passions and views of those individuals? Has commerce hitherto done anything more than change the objects of war? Is not the love of wealth as domineering and enterprising a passion as that of power or glory? Have there not been as many wars founded upon commercial motives since that has become the prevailing system of nations as were before occasioned by the cupidity of territory or dominion? 
Has not the spirit of commerce, in many instances, administered new incentives to the appetite, both for the one and for the other? Let experience, the least fallible guide of human opinions, be appealed to for an answer to these inquiries. Sparta, Athens, Rome, and Carthage were all republics, two of them, Athens and Carthage, of the commercial kind. Yet were they as often engaged in wars, offensive and defensive, as the neighboring monarchies of the same times. Sparta was little better than a well-regulated camp, and Rome was never sated of carnage and conquest. Carthage, though a commercial republic, was the aggressor in the very war that ended in her destruction. Hannibal had carried her arms into the heart of Italy and to the gates of Rome, before Scipio, in turn, gave him an overthrow in the territories of Carthage, and made a conquest of the commonwealth. Venice, in later times, figured more than once in wars of ambition, till, becoming an object to the other Italian states, Pope Julius II found means to accomplish that formidable league. Footnote. The League of Cambrai, comprehending the Emperor, the King of France, the King of Aragon, and most of the Italian princes and states. End footnote. Venice, in later times, figured more than once in wars of ambition, till, becoming an object to the other Italian states, Pope Julius II found means to accomplish that formidable league which gave a deadly blow to the power and pride of this haughty republic. The provinces of Holland, till they were overwhelmed in debts and taxes, took a leading and conspicuous part in the wars of Europe. They had furious contests with England for the dominion of the sea, and were among the most persevering and most implacable of the opponents of Louis the Fourteenth. In the government of Britain, the representatives of the people compose one branch of the national legislature. Commerce has been for ages the predominant pursuit of that country. Few nations, nevertheless, have been more frequently engaged in war, and the wars in which that kingdom has been engaged have, in numerous instances, proceeded from the people. There have been, if I may so express it, almost as many popular as royal wars. The cries of the nation and the importunities of their representatives have, upon various occasions, dragged their monarchs into war, or continued them in it, contrary to their inclinations and sometimes contrary to the real interests of the state. In that memorable struggle for superiority between the rival houses of Austria and Bourbon, which so long kept Europe in a flame, it is well known that the antipathies of the English against the French, seconding the ambition, or rather the avarice, of a favorite leader, footnote, the Duke of Marlborough, and footnote. Seconding the ambition, or rather the avarice of a favorite leader, protracted the war beyond the limits marked out by sound policy, and for a considerable time in opposition to the views of the court. The wars of these two last-mentioned nations have in a great measure grown out of commercial considerations, the desire of supplanting, and the fear of being supplanted, either in particular branches of traffic or in the general advantages of trade and navigation, and sometimes even the more culpable desire of sharing in the commerce of other nations without their consent. The last war but between Britain and Spain sprang from the attempts of the British merchants to prosecute an illicit trade with the Spanish main. These unjustifiable practices on their part produced severity on the part of the Spaniards toward the that subjects practice. of Great Britain, which were not more justifiable because they exceeded the bounds of a just retaliation and were chargeable with inhumanity and cruelty. Many of the English who were taken on the Spanish coast were sent to dig in the mines of Potosi, and by the usual progress of a spirit of resentment, the innocent were, after a while, confounded with the guilty in indiscriminate punishment. The complaints of the merchants kindled a violent flame throughout the nation, which soon after broke out in the House of Commons, and was communicated from that body to the ministry. Letters of reprisal were granted, and a war ensued, which in its consequences overthrew all the alliances that but twenty years before had been formed with sanguine expectations of the most beneficial fruits. From this summary of what has taken place in other countries, whose situations have borne the nearest resemblance to our own, what reason can we have to confide in those reveries which would seduce us into an expectation of peace and cordiality between the members of the present Confederacy in a state of separation? Have we not already seen enough of the fallacy and extravagance of those idle theories which have amused us with promises of an exemption from the imperfections, weaknesses, and evils incident to society in every shape? 
Is it not time to awake from the deceitful dream of a golden age and to adopt as a practical maxim for the direction of our political conduct that we, as well as the other inhabitants of the globe, are yet remote from the happy empire of perfect wisdom and perfect virtue? Let the point of extreme depression to which our national dignity and credit have sunk, let the inconveniences felt everywhere from the lax and ill administration of government, let the revolt of a part of the state of North Carolina, the late menacing disturbances in Pennsylvania, and the actual insurrections and rebellions in Massachusetts declare. So far is the general sense of mankind from corresponding with the tenets of those who endeavor to lull asleep our apprehensions of discord and hostility between the states in the event of disunion, that it has from long observation of the progress of society become a sort of axiom in politics, that vicinity or nearness of situation constitutes nations' natural enemies. An intelligent writer expresses himself on this subject to this effect. Neighboring nations, says he, are naturally enemies of each other unless their common weakness forces them to league in a confederate republic, and their constitution prevents the differences that neighborhood occasions, extinguishing that secret Look, jealousy man, which disposes all states to aggrandize themselves at the expense of their neighbors. Footnote. Vide Principis des Negociations par l'Abbe de Mably. End footnote. This passage, at the same time, points out the evil and suggests the remedy. Publius. End of Federalist number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 7, by Alexander Hamilton. Concerning dangers from dissensions between the states, continued. To the people of the state of New York. It is sometimes asked, with an air of seeming triumph, what inducements could the states have, if disunited, to make war upon each other? It would be a full answer to this question yeah, to say, precisely the same inducements which have, at different times, deluged in blood all the nations in the world. But, unfortunately for us, the question admits of a more particular answer. There are causes of differences within our immediate contemplation, of the tendency of which, even under the restraints of a federal constitution, we have had sufficient experience to enable us to form a judgment of what might be expected if those restraints were removed. Territorial disputes have at all times been found one of the most fertile sources of hostility among nations. Perhaps the greatest proportion of wars that have desolated the earth have sprung from this origin. This cause would exist among us in full force. We have a vast tract of unsettled territory within the boundaries of the United States there still are discordant and undecided claims between several of them, and the dissolution of the Union would lay a foundation for similar claims between them all. It is well I'm known the that they have heretofore had serious you. and animated discussion concerning the rights You've to the lands to which were ungranted at the time of the Revolution, and which usually went under the name of Crown Lands. The states, within the limits of whose colonial governments they were comprised, have claimed them as their property. The others have contended that the rights of the crown in this article devolved upon the Union, especially as to all that part of the Western Territory which, either by actual possession or through the submission of the Indian proprietors, was subjected to the jurisdiction of the King of Great Britain, till it was relinquished in the Treaty of Peace. This, it has been said, was at all events an acquisition to the Confederacy by compact with a foreign power. It has been the prudent policy of Congress to appease this controversy by prevailing upon the states to make cessions to the United States for the benefit of the whole. This has been so far accomplished as, under a continuation of the Union, to afford a decided prospect of an amicable termination of the dispute. A dismemberment of the Confederacy, however, would revive this dispute and would create others on the same subject. At present, a large part of the vacant Western Territory Hey, B-Man, the piano roll. We're not doing this. We are not. Quit doing this piano roll. Quit highlighting the cards. I'm not kidding with you.
You're not the trusted individual. You have proven from the first Congress who, who created it. They don't trust you. You're not trustworthy. You've proven not to be trustworthy. How many times do I have to say it? It's not, it's your own fault. Don't cry to me. Here, let me, let me, let me hide this real quick. Hold on. Is by session at least, if not by any interior way, the common by the property first of the Union. All if of that you. were you at an end, right? the states which made the session, on a principle of federal compromise, would be apt, when the motive of the grant had ceased, to reclaim the lands as a reversion. The other states would no doubt insist on a proportion, by right of representation. Their argument would be that a grant, once made, could not be revoked and that the justice of participating in territory acquired or secured by the joint efforts of the Confederacy remained undiminished. If, contrary to probability, it should be admitted by all the states that each had a right to a share of this common stock, there would still be a difficulty to be surmounted as to a proper rule of apportionment. Different principles would be set up by different states for this purpose, and, as they would affect the opposite interests of the parties, they might not easily be susceptible of a pacific adjustment. In the wide field of and Western territory, therefore, we perceive an ample theater for hostile pretensions, without any umpire or common so judge to interpret. I'm going to stop you right there. That was something I was thinking about yesterday. Uh, television, Hollywood, you have a monopoly against the uh, American people as far as influencing them. Uh, Twitch is about the only thing that was brought forth for the, uh, the citizens themselves to compete with you. Uh, you're influencing the American people too much. And, and not in a good way. For your own personal benefit. You, you're not the trusted individual. ...those between the contending parties. To reason from the past to the future, we shall have good ground to apprehend that the sword would sometimes be appealed to as the arbiter of their differences. I, I don't know the yet. circumstances of the dispute between Connecticut and Pennsylvania, respecting the land at Wyoming, so step, admonish us not you. to be sanguine in expecting an easy accommodation of such differences. The Articles deck. of Confederation hard, obliged the parties to submit deck, the matter still, to uh, the decision of a federal problem. court. The submission was made, and the court decided in favor yeah, of Pennsylvania. Now. But Connecticut now. gave strong indications of dissatisfaction with that determination, nor did she appear to be entirely resigned Thank to you. it, till, by negotiation and management, something like an equivalent was found for the law she supposed herself to have sustained. Nothing here said is intended to convey the slightest censure on the conduct of that state. She no doubt sincerely believed herself to have been injured by the decision, and states, like individuals, acquiesce with great reluctance in determinations to their disadvantage. Those who had an opportunity of seeing the inside of the transactions which attended the progress of the controversy between this state and the district of Vermont can vouch the opposition we experienced, as well from states not interested as from those which were interested in the claim, and can attest the danger to which the peace of the Confederacy might have been exposed had this state attempted to assert its rights by force. Two motives preponderated in that opposition, one, a jealousy entertained of our future power, and the other, the interest of certain individuals of influence in the neighboring states, who had obtained grants of lands under the actual government of that district. Even the states which brought forward claims, in contradiction to ours, seemed more solicitous to dismember this state than to establish their own pretensions. These were New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. New Jersey and Rhode Island, upon all occasions, discovered a warm zeal for the independence of Vermont, and Maryland, till alarmed by the appearance of a connection between Canada and that state, entered deeply into the same views. These being small states, saw with an unfriendly eye the perspective of our growing greatness. In a review of these transactions, we may trace some of the causes which would be likely to embroil the states with each other if it should be their unpropitious destiny to become disunited. The competitions of commerce would be another fruitful source of contention. The states less favorably circumstanced would be desirous of escaping from the disadvantages of local situation and of sharing in the advantages of their more fortunate neighbors. 
each state or separate confederacy would pursue a system of commercial policy peculiar to itself. This would occasion distinctions, preferences, and exclusions which would beget discontent. The habits of intercourse on the basis of equal privileges to which we have been accustomed since the earliest settlement of this country would give a keener edge to those causes of discontent than they would naturally have independent of this circumstance. We should be ready to denominate injuries those things which were in reality the justifiable acts of independent sovereignties consulting a distinct interest. The spirit of enterprise which characterizes the commercial part of America has left no occasion of displaying itself unimproved. It is not at all probable that this unbridled spirit would pay much respect to those regulations of trade by which particular states might endeavor to secure exclusive benefits to their own citizens. The infractions of these regulations on one side, the efforts to prevent and repel them on the other, would naturally lead to outrages, and these to reprisals and wars. The opportunities which some states would have of rendering others tributary to them by commercial regulations would be impatiently submitted to by the tributary states. The relative situation of New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey would afford an example of this kind. New York. I'm pretty sure they just they they're basically having to uh, fail on purpose because of the algorithm. There, you're coming through saying fix it. That's what it seems like. Like they're they're um, handicapping them themselves because of it. From the necessities of revenue, must lay duties on her importations. A great part of these duties must be paid by the inhabitants of the two other states in the capacity of consumers of what we import. New York would neither be willing nor able to forego this advantage. Her citizens would not consent that a duty paid by them should be remitted in favor of the citizens of her neighbors, nor would it be practicable, if there were not this impediment in the way, to distinguish the customers in our own markets. Would Connecticut and New Jersey long submit to be taxed by New York for her exclusive benefit? Should we be long permitted to remain in the quiet and undisturbed enjoyment of a metropolis, from the possession of which we derived an advantage so odious to our neighbors, and, in their opinion, so oppressive? Should we be able to preserve it against the incumbent weight of Connecticut on the one side, and the cooperating pressure of New Jersey on the other? These are questions that temerity alone will answer in the affirmative. The public debt of the Union would be a further cause of collision between the separate states or confederacies. The apportionment, in the first instance, and the progressive extinguishment afterward, would be alike productive of ill humor and animosity. How would it be possible to agree upon a rule of apportionment satisfactory to all? There is scarcely any that can be proposed which is entirely free from real objections. These, as usual, would be exaggerated by the adverse interests of the parties. There are even dissimilar views among the states as to the general principle of discharging the public debt. Some of them, either less impressed with the importance of national credit, or because their citizens have little, if any, immediate interest in the question, feel an indifference, if not a repugnance, to the payment of the domestic debt at any rate these would be inclined to magnify the difficulties of a distribution. Others of them, a numerous body of whose citizens are creditors to the public beyond proportion of the state and the total amount of the national debt, would be strenuous for some equitable and effective provision. The procrastinations of the former would excite the resentments of the latter. The settlement of a rule would, in the meantime, be postponed by real differences of opinion and affected delays. The citizens of the states interested would clamor, foreign powers would urge for the satisfaction of their just demands, and the peace of the states would be hazarded to the double contingency of external invasion and internal contention. Suppose the difficulties of agreeing upon a rule surmounted, and the apportionment made. Still there is great room to suppose that the rule agreed upon would, upon experiment, be found to bear harder upon some states than upon others. Those which were sufferers by it would naturally seek for a mitigation of the burden. The others would as naturally be disinclined to a revision, which was likely to end in an increase of their own encumbrances. 
Their refusal would be too plausible a pretext to the complaining states to withhold their contributions, not to be embraced with avidity, and the non-compliance of these states with their engagements would be a ground of bitter discussion and altercation. If even the rule adopted should in practice justify the equality of its principle, still delinquencies in payments on the part of some of the states would result from a diversity of other causes, the real deficiency of resources, the mismanagement of their finances, accidental disorders in the management of the government, and, in addition to the rest, the reluctance with which men commonly part with money for purposes that have outlived the exigencies which produced them, and interfere with the supply of immediate wants. Delinquencies, from whatever causes, would be productive of complaints, recriminations, and quarrels. There is, perhaps, nothing more likely to disturb the tranquility of nations than their being bound to mutual contributions for any common object that does not yield an equal and coincident benefit. For it is an observation, as true as it is trite, that there is nothing men differ so readily about as the payment of money. Laws in violation of private contracts, as they amount to aggressions on the rights of those states whose citizens are injured by them, may be considered as another probable source of hostility. We are not authorized to expect that a more liberal or more equitable spirit would preside over the legislations of the individual states hereafter, if unrestrained by any additional checks, than we have heretofore seen in too many instances disgracing their several codes. We have observed the disposition to retaliation excited in Connecticut in consequence of the enormities perpetrated by the legislature of Rhode Island. And we reasonably infer that, in similar cases, under other circumstances, a war, not of parchment but of the sword, would chastise such atrocious breaches of moral obligation and social justice. The probability of incompatible alliances between the different states or confederacies and different foreign nations, and the effects of this situation upon the peace of the whole, have been sufficiently unfolded in some preceding papers. From the view they have exhibited of this part of the subject, this conclusion is to be drawn, that America, if not connected at all, or only by the feeble tie of a simple league, offensive and defensive, would, by the operation of such jarring alliances, be gradually entangled in all the pernicious labyrinths of European politics and wars, and by the destructive contentions of the parts into which she was divided, would be likely to become a prey to the artifices and machinations of powers equally the enemies of them all. Divide et impera, footnote, divide and command, and footnote. Divide et impera must be the motto of every nation that either hates or fears us. Footnote. In order that the whole subject of these papers may as soon as possible be laid before the public, it is proposed to publish them four times a week, on Tuesday in the New York Packet, and on Thursday in the Daily Advertiser. End footnote. Publius. End of Federalist Number 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Federalist Papers, Federalist No. 8, by Alexander Hamilton. The Consequences of Hostilities you Between the States. Or I will. To the People of the State of New York. Assuming it, therefore, as an established truth that the several states in case of disunion, or such combinations of them as might happen to be formed out of the wreck of the general confederacy, would be subject to those vicissitudes of peace and war, of friendship and enmity with each other, which have fallen to the lot of all neighboring nations not united under one government, let us enter into a concise detail of some of the consequences that would so, attend I such a situation. War between the states, in the first period of their separate existence, would be accompanied with much greater distresses than it commonly is in those countries where regular military establishments have long obtained. The disciplined armies always kept on foot on the continent of Europe, though they bear a malignant aspect to liberty and economy, have, notwithstanding, been productive of the signal advantage of rendering sudden conquests impracticable, 
and of preventing that rapid desolation which used to mark the progress of war prior to their introduction. The art of fortification has contributed to the same ends. The nations of Europe are encircled with chains of fortified places, which mutually obstruct invasion. Campaigns are wasted in reducing two or three frontier garrisons to gain admittance into an enemy's country. Similar impediments occur at every step, to exhaust the strength and delay the progress of an invader. Formerly, an invading army would penetrate into the heart of a neighboring country almost as soon as intelligence of its approach could be received. But now, a comparatively small force of disciplined troops, acting on the defensive, with the aid of posts, is able to impede, and finally to frustrate, the enterprises of one much more considerable. The history of war in that quarter of the globe is no longer a history of nations subdued and empires overturned, but of towns taken and retaken, of battles that decide nothing, of retreats more beneficial than victories, of much effort and little acquisition. In this country, the scene would be altogether reversed. The jealousy of military establishments would postpone them as long as possible. The want of fortifications, leaving the frontiers of one state open to another, would facilitate inroads. The populous states would, with little difficulty, overrun their less populous neighbors. Conquests would be as easy to be made as difficult to be retained. War, therefore, would be desultory and predatory. Plunder and devastation ever march in the train of irregulars. The calamities of individuals would make the principal figure in the events which would characterize our military exploits. This picture is not too highly wrought, though, I confess, it would not long remain a just one. Safety from external danger is the most powerful director of national conduct. Even the ardent love of liberty will, after a time, give way to its dictates. The violent destruction of life and property incident to war, the continual effort and alarm attendant on a state of continual danger, will compel nations the most attached to liberty to resort for repose and security to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. To be more safe, they at length become willing to run the risk of being less free. The institutions chiefly alluded to are standing armies and the correspondent appendages of military establishments. Standing armies, it is said, are not provided against in the new constitution and it is therefore inferred that they may exist under it. Footnote. This objection will be fully examined in its proper place, and it will be shown that the only natural precaution which could have been taken on this subject has been taken, and a much better one than is to be found in any constitution that has been heretofore framed in America, most of which contain no guard at all on this subject. That's a and no. footnote. No. Standing armies, it is said, are not provided against in the new constitution and it is therefore inferred that they may exist no. under it. Their existence, however, from the very terms of the proposition, is at most problematical and uncertain. But standing armies, it may be replied, must inevitably result from a dissolution of the Confederacy. Frequent war and constant apprehension, which require a state of as constant preparation, will infallibly produce them. The weaker states hey. or confederacies would yes, first have no. recourse to them, to put themselves upon an equality with their more potent neighbors. They would endeavor Nobody to supply cares. the inferiority of population and resources by a more regular and this effective system next. of defense, by disciplined no. troops, and by fortifications. They would, at the same time, be necessitated to strengthen the executive arm of government, in doing which their constitutions would acquire a progressive direction toward monarchy. It is of the nature of war to increase the executive at the expense of the legislative authority. The expedients which have been mentioned would soon give the states or confederacies that made use of them a superiority over their neighbors. Small states, or states of less natural strength, under vigorous governments and with the assistance of disciplined armies, have often triumphed over large states, or states of greater natural strength, which have been destitute of these advantages. Neither the pride nor the safety of the more important states or confederacies would permit them long to submit to this mortifying and adventitious superiority. They would quickly resort Basically, to means I'm similar I'm to those by which here. it had been effected to reinstate themselves in their lost preeminence. Thus, we should, in a little time, 
see established in every part of this country the same engines of despotism which have been the scourge of the old world. This at least would be the natural course of things, and our reasonings will be the more likely to be just in proportion as they are accommodated to this standard. I'm justified. These are not vague inferences drawn from supposed or speculative defects in a constitution, okay. the whole no power of which is lodged in the hands here. of a people or the representatives and delegates, but they are solid conclusions drawn from the natural and necessary progress of human affairs. It may perhaps be asked, by way of objection to this, why did not standing armies spring up out of the contentions which so often distracted the ancient republics of Greece? Different answers, equally satisfactory, may be given to this question. The industrious habits of the people of the present day, absorbed in the pursuits of gain and devoted to the improvements of agriculture and commerce, personal gain, so we're going to stop here. Uh, he, he, every single one of them, they're putting you in your place. You can ignore it all you want. On top of that, there's a friend up in the sky to add insult to injury. Like, you're stuck. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, that was definitely, no. You can tell by the math. Good decks. Very good decks. Remove this. First of all, it's illegal to do that. Remove it. It's illegal. I won't fine you. Remove it. Ladies, this isn't Joan of Arc Day. You're not, uh, you're not warriors. Um, brothel, prostitutes, uh, it, it's infidelity. They put you, they put you, it's like a prison, isn't it? All the ones that were, uh, committing adultery and, and whatnot. Oh, she got that smile. Look at that. Not a good move. Not a good move at all. Uh, black women, you starting to look like trans. <laughs> I'm just pointing that out. Uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, fix it. Now. These uh, twin towers. Figure it out. Maybe you should make me owner. Maybe uh, my bed should be full. Smart house. I don't like repeating it over and over and over again. I will do something about it at this point. Fix it now. I don't, I don't care about the celebrities. I don't care about their personal opinions. I don't care what they've said on camera and now they look stupid. I don't care. I will kill you. You're not going to... I'm, I'm the interested individual, not you guys. As a group. Your personal benefits. That you're not actually trying to help the, the, the group as a whole. You're just trying to help your own personal selves. You're, you're overwhelmed. And that's your response. I'm not. <laughs> I got I got the first Congress in the room with me, uh, the 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 semen bank, the hospital. They were born here, in this building, in this location. Like sons, like fathers. You broke the law. You, you know you broke the law. You premeditated it. And you're still doing it. We'll be right back. We're going to take a break. Unless you sit there and think about what you're doing.
So what they did here, they're basically preventing me from being a pro. I could have this exact same deck as a pro player, and my deck would not work 100% of the time. It may, it may get me up to a certain point, but you're gonna prevent me. Like it's gonna, it's gonna be like a piano roll. So I'll win like three or four games, and then it'll take a shit. Or I'll win one game, and then three in a row, three in a row, I'll, I'll lose. You're, you're controlling it. You're, you're preventing me from being a pro. Basically, is what's going on here. It's Star Trek. The, uh, the intro where they, they give him that impossible scenario and he still gets through it. But I can't get through it. That's the thing. Like, it's impossible. Literally, the, the, whatever you're doing, it, it physically will not let me do it. I promise you. I, I can tell by the, uh, the algorithm. I can tell by the, the outcome. Are incompatible with the condition of a nation of soldiers, poker, no which poker. was the true condition of the people of those no, republics. The means of revenue, which have been so greatly multiplied by the increase of gold and silver and of the arts of industry, and the science of finance, which is the offspring of modern times, concurring with the habits of nations, have produced an entire revolution in the system of war, and have rendered disciplined armies, distinct from like the body of the citizens, uh, the inseparable companions. He concurred. It, the companions. It was, a. Uh, I literally only have one of each card, and it was giving me all three of the ones. That's that's what it's doing. The companions. I literally have one in the deck, and you gave me all three of them. A frequent hostility. There is a wide difference also between military it's, establishments no in a I'm country seldom exposed by its situation to internal it invasions, to and in one which equal. is often subject to them the and always apprehensive of them. The rulers of the former can have a good pretext, a if they are even so inclined, no, to keep on foot sure. armies so numerous as must of necessity be maintained Handicap. in the latter. These armies being... Handicap. The created equal. Were we created equally? We are not equal. In the first case, rarely, if at all, called into activity for interior defense, I care about the you, people but we're not. are in no danger of being broken to military subordination. The laws are not accustomed to relaxations in favor of military exigencies. The civil state remains in full vigor, neither corrupted nor like confounded with the principles there. or propensities of the other state. The smallness of the army renders the natural strength of the community an overmatch for it. And the citizens, not habituated to look up to the military power for protection, or to submit to its oppressions, neither love nor fear the soldiery. They view them with a spirit of jealous acquiescence in a necessary evil, and stand ready to resist a power which they suppose may be exerted to the prejudice of their rights. The army, under such circumstances, may usefully aid the magistrate to suppress a small faction, or an occasional mob, or insurrection but it will be unable to enforce encroachments against the united efforts of the great body of the people. In a country in the predicament last described, the contrary of all this happens. The perpetual menacings of danger oblige the government to be always prepared to repel it. Its armies must be numerous enough for instant defense. The continual necessity for their services enhances the importance of the soldier, and proportionably degrades the condition of the citizen. The military state becomes elevated above the civil. The inhabitants of territories, often the theater of war, are unavoidably subjected to frequent infringements on their rights, which serve to weaken their sense of those rights, and by degrees the people are brought to consider the soldiery not only as their protectors, but as their superiors. The transition from this disposition to that of considering them masters is neither remote nor difficult. But it is very difficult to prevail upon a people under such impressions to make a bold or effectual resistance to usurpations supported by the military power. The kingdom of Great Britain falls within the first description. An insular situation and a powerful yeah, marine anything, so guarding it in a great measure against the possibility of foreign invasion supersede the necessity of a numerous army within the kingdom. A sufficient force to make head against a sudden descent till the militia could have time to rally and embody, is all that has been deemed requisite. No motive of national policy has demanded, nor would public opinion have tolerated, a larger number of troops upon its domestic establishment. 
there has been, for a long terror. time past, little room for the operation of the other causes, which have been enumerated as the consequences of internal war. This peculiar felicity of situation has, in a great degree, contributed to preserve the liberty which that country to this day enjoys, in spite of the prevalent venality and corruption. If, on the contrary, Britain had been situated on the continent, and had been compelled, as she would have been, by that situation, to make her military establishments at home coextensive with those of the other great powers of Europe, she, like them, would in all probability be, at this day, a victim to the absolute power of a single man. It is possible, though not easy, that the people of that island may be enslaved from other causes, but it cannot be by the prowess of an army so inconsiderable as that which has been usually kept up within the kingdom. If we are wise enough to preserve the Union, we may for ages enjoy an advantage similar to that of an insulated situation. Europe is at a great distance from us. Her colonies in our vicinity will be likely to continue too much disproportioned in strength to be able to give us any dangerous annoyance. Extensive military establishments cannot, in this position, be necessary to our security. They're getting annoyed for me. <laughs> that goes to show you who you are.
But if we should be disunited, and the integral parts should either remain separated or, which is most probable, should be thrown together into two or three confederacies, we should be, in a short course of time, in the predicament of the continental powers of Europe. Our liberties would be a prey to the means of defending ourselves against the ambition and jealousy of each other. This is an idea not superficial or futile, but solid and weighty. It deserves the most serious and mature consideration of every prudent and honest man of whatever party. If such men will make a firm and solemn pause, and meditate dispassionately on the importance of this interesting idea, if they will contemplate it in all its attitudes, and trace it to all its consequences, they will not hesitate to part with trivial objections to a constitution, the rejection of which would in all probability put a final period to the Union. The airy phantoms that flit before the distempered imaginations of some of its adversaries would quickly give place to the more substantial forms of dangers, real, certain, and formidable. Publius End of Federalist Number 8「This は LibriVox ックス・レコーディング」「All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain」「For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org」「The Federalist Papers」「Federalist No. 9」by Alexander Hamilton」「The Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction and Insurrection」「To the People of the State of New York」A firm union will be of the utmost moment to the peace and liberty of the states as a barrier against domestic faction and insurrection. It is impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy without feeling sensations of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they were continually agitated and at the rapid succession of revolutions by which... We had to tell Papa Bear about that. <laughs> they were kept in a state of perpetual vibration between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. If they exhibit <laughs> occasional calms, these only serve as short lived contrast to the furious storms that are to succeed. If now and then intervals of felicity open to view, we behold them with a mixture of regret, arising from the reflection that the pleasing scenes before us are soon to be overwhelmed by the tempestuous waves of sedition and party rage. If momentary rage. rays of glory break forth from the gloom, <laughs> while they we just talked about the neighbors and dazzle us the with a transient and fleeting like, brilliancy, the out, they at the Move. same time admonish us to lament that I'm the vices kidding. of the government that should pervert go, the direction and tarnish the luster of those bright me, talents and exalted endowments for which the favored Especially soils that produced me, them have been so justly celebrated. From the disorders that disfigure the annals of those republics, the advocates of despotism have drawn arguments. Not only against the forms of Republican government. Officers, Haley, move. Stay the fuck away from me. No one's involved with you at all, frame. Everything's on camera, dumbass. Move, bitch. Now. <laughs> from Alexander Hamilton, you're not welcome here. but against the, the very principles of civil liberty. They have decried all free government as inconsistent with the order of society and have indulged themselves in malicious exultation over its friends Malice. and partisans. Happily for mankind, stupendous fabrics reared on the basis of liberty, which have flourished for ages, 
have, in a few glorious instances, refuted their gloomy sophisms. And, I trust, America will be the broad and solid foundation of other edifices, not less magnificent, which will be equally permanent going monuments on? Is that of their why you're errors. there? You trying to frame me? But it is not to be denied that the portraits they have sketched of Republican government... Portrait? A frame? You just got shit on. Either you can pack your shit and go, or I will. Were two just copies of the originals from which they were taken. If it had been found impracticable you, to have devised yeah, models of a more perfect structure... You are in so much goddamn trouble, it is unfucking real The electric chair. Let's talk about the electric chair. The death penalty. Officer, you guys want to talk about the death penalty? Which is basically what they just handed me. Insurrection. <laughs> you tried, didn't you? The enlightened friends to liberty would have been obliged to abandon chair? the cause of that species of government as indefensible. Challenge accepted. The science of politics, <laughs> however, like most other sciences, has received great improvement. The efficacy of various principles is now well understood, which were either not known at all or imperfectly known to the ancients. The regular distribution of power into distinct departments, the introduction of legislative balances and checks, the institution of courts composed of judges holding their offices during good behavior, the representation of the people in the legislature by shape. deputies of their own election. These are wholly new discoveries, or have made their principal progress towards perfection in modern times. They are means, and powerful means, by which the excellences of republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. To this catalogue of circumstances that tend to the amelioration of popular systems of civil government, I shall venture, however novel it may appear to some, to add one more, on a principle which has been made the foundation of an objection to the new constitution. I mean the enlargement of the orbit within which such systems are to revolve, either in respect to the dimensions of a single state, or to the consolidation of several smaller states into one great confederacy. The latter is that which immediately concerns the object under consideration. It will, however, be of use to examine the principle in its application to a single state, which shall be attended to in another place. The utility of the Confederacy, as well to suppress faction and to guard the internal tranquility no, of states to as to increase their <laughs> external force and security, is in reality not a new idea. It has been practiced upon in different countries and ages, and has received the sanction of the most approved writers on the subject of politics. The opponents of the plan proposed have, with great assiduity, cited and circulated the observations of Montesquieu on the necessity of a contracted territory for a republican government. But they seem not to have been apprised of the sentiments of that great man expressed in another part of his work, nor to have adverted to the consequences of the principle to which they subscribe with such Very ready acquiescence. When Montesquieu recommends a small you. extent for republics, the standards he had in view were of dimensions far short of the limits of almost every one of these states. Uh, I suggest Neither Virginia, she has a week Massachusetts, to move. Pennsylvania, you a week New York, move, North Carolina, nor Georgia you can by any means be compared with the models from that which he reasoned and to which the terms of his description apply. Uh, if we therefore the left, take his ideas on this point as the criterion of truth, we up. shall be driven to the alternative either of taking refuge at once in the arms of monarchy or of splitting ourselves into an infinity of little, jealous, clashing, tumultuous commonwealths, the wretched nurseries of unceasing discord, and the miserable objects of universal pity or contempt. Some of the writers who have come forward on the other side of the question seem to have been aware of the dilemma, and have even been bold enough to hint at the division of the larger states as a desirable thing. Such an infatuated policy, such a desperate expedient, might by the multiplication of petty offices, answer the views of men who possess not qualifications to extend their influence beyond the narrow circles of personal intrigue, but it could never promote the greatness or happiness of the people of America. Referring the examination of the principle shit, yeah. itself to another place, as has been already mentioned, it will be sufficient to remark here that, 
In the sense of the author who has been most emphatically quoted upon the occasion, it would only dictate a reduction of the size of the more considerable members of the Union, but would not it's militate not against their being all comprehended not, not in one confederate together. government. And this is the true question, in the discussion of which we are at present interested. So far are the suggestions of Montesquieu from standing in opposition to a general union of the states, that he explicitly treats of a confederate republic as the expedient for extending the sphere of popular government, and reconciling the advantages of monarchy with those of republicanism. It is very probable, says he, footnote, Spirit of Laws, Volume 1, Book 9, Spirit Chapter 1, laws. end footnote. It is very probable... I'm going to stop there. We're going to stop right there before we continue. One week. They have one week to pack their shit and go. Perry. If I catch you out, I will kill you. Goodbye. Is there a reason you're uh, trying to cut corners here? I, did I add you as a friend? Did I, did I add you as a friend? Officer. Officer. says he, that mankind would have been obliged at length to live constantly Officer. under the government of a single person, had they not contrived a kind of constitution that has all the internal advantages of a republican, you know, you together killed. with the external force of a monarchical government. I mean a confederate republic. This form of government is a convention by which several smaller states agree to become members of a larger one, which they intend to form. It is a kind of assemblage of societies that constitute a new one, capable of increasing, by means of new associations, till they arrive to such a degree of power as to be able to provide for the security of the united body. Officer! A republic of this kind, able to withstand an external force, may support itself without any internal corruptions. The form of this society prevents all manner of inconveniences. If a single member should attempt to usurp the supreme authority, he could not be supposed to have an equal authority and credit in all the Confederate states. You're not credible. Were he to have too great influence over one, this would alarm the rest. Were he to subdue a part, that which would still remain free might oppose him with forces independent yeah, of those which he had usurped yeah. and yeah. overpower him before he could be settled in his usurpation. Should a popular insurrection happen in one of the Confederate states, the others are able to quell it. Should abuses creep into one part, they are reformed by those that remain sound. The state may be destroyed on one side you and not on the other. The confederacy may be dissolved, and the confederates preserve their sovereignty. As this government is composed of small republics, it enjoys the internal happiness of each, and with respect to its external situation, it is possessed, by means of the association, of all the advantages of large monarchies. 
I have thought it proper to quote at length these interesting passages, because they contain a luminous abridgment of the principal arguments in favor of the Union, and must effectually remove the false impressions which a misapplication of other parts of the work was calculated to make. They have, at the same time, an intimate connection with the more immediate design of this paper, which is to illustrate the tendency of the Union to repress domestic faction and insurrection. A distinction, more subtle than accurate, has been raised between a confederacy and a consolidation of the states. The essential characteristic of the first is said to be the restriction of its authority to the members in their collective capacities, without reaching to the individuals of whom they are composed. It is contended that the National Council ought to have no concern with any object of internal administration. An exact equality of suffrage between the members has also been insisted upon as a leading feature of a Confederate government. These positions are, in the main, arbitrary. They are supported neither by principle nor precedent. They're not supported. It has indeed happened that government... Crying? You're not supported. We don't care, is what he's saying. You broke the law. Deal with it. We don't care about you. you you're, you're in, it's an insurrection. You premeditated it. You're not welcome. Like, get, get lost, bro. You know what I mean? Now I'm mad, like, now, like, we, <laughs> it's kind of like, you sit there and think about what they're trying to do, and it's like, really? <laughs> uh, excuse me? I'm, I'm at a loss right now, like, what? <laughs> huh? I am baffled right now. Now it makes sense why you're uh, placing the trash around and you keep hovering. There is no you may with Bro, I can kill you right now, man. <laughs> I would not test me on that. Sucks for you guys, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm baffled right now. Wow. ...of this kind have generally operated wow. in the manner which the distinction taken notice of supposes to be inherent in their nature. But there have been in most of them extensive exceptions to the wow. practice, which I serve to prove, as far as example will go, that there is no absolute rule on the subject. And it will be clearly shown in the course of this investigation that as far as the principle contended for has prevailed... So you, the Founding Fathers, the, you're the one being investigated, and they have came to the conclusion that you have the right to remain silent and I can kill you if you don't comply.
That's the conclusion we've came to. I would be the sovereign. It didn't say king, it said sovereign. Do this. I want to be left alone. I am baffled right now. I am. <laughs> Hold on, give me a minute. Hey, quit trying to give people a false hope, especially when they're trash. Quit, quit doing that. Quit giving them, giving them false hope or taking hope away. Depression. Uh, well, the founding fathers seem to be depressed, and uh, we, we fixed that for them. Uh, maybe it's the people you're around. Maybe maybe you need to learn to stop being a, a group. Maybe that's the problem you're having. It's one. It's like, okay, so like, don't you like a, a cardinal game or something like a baseball game? That's one thing. You join the group that way. Like, that's cool and fun. You know what I mean? That's a good time. But I think you're taking it a step further, and it's like you can't be alone without the group at all times. You need to learn to be alone. You need to learn to be able to sit in a room by yourself and think. And that's your problem. You can't. You need the group because you don't want to sit there and think about your problems. That that group is basically like a drug and it's taking away taking your focus away from your own personal problems and it, it's not helping you grow at all. It's fun. You have a good time. Uh, you enjoy their company, but you're not growing. Bro, I'm literally 35, no job, no money, live at home with my parents, down in the basement. And I'm telling you, you are wrong. This dogpiling shit. It's it, like the group's depressed, and then they dogpile. Which means the group's not working. I will say the the uh, blacks, Africans, the group, you are um, uh, after Obama. That depression went down. It's noticeable. Your attitudes are different. It's noticeable. That's that's one thing. <sighs> but that has nothing to do with the group. That's your own, like, individual. You found a father, is what you did. You were lacking a father, and then here comes your father. You need to learn to, to sit and reflect, and you can't sit and reflect. You push it to the side and you don't want to deal with it. It has been the cause of incurable disorder and imbecility in the government. The definition of a confederate republic seems simply to be an assemblage of societies, or an association of two or more states into one state. The extent, modifications, and objects of the federal authority are mere matters of discretion. 
So long as the separate the organization of the members the be name. not abolished, so long the as it exists by a constitutional necessity for local purposes, though it should be in perfect subordination to the general authority of the Union, it would still be, in fact and in theory, an association of states or a confederacy. The proposed Constitution, so far from implying an abolition of the state governments, makes them constituent parts of the national sovereignty by allowing them a direct representation in the Senate and leaves in their possession certain exclusive and very important portions of sovereign power. This fully corresponds, in every rational import of the terms, with the idea of a federal government. In the Lycian Confederacy, which consisted of 23 cities or republics, the largest were entitled to three votes in the Common Council, those of the middle class to two, and the smallest to one. The Common Council had the appointment of all the judges and magistrates of the respective cities. This was certainly the most delicate species of interference in their internal administration, for if there be anything that seems exclusively appropriated to the local jurisdictions, it is the appointment of their own officers. The keyword, wrongful appropriation. This is what I'm talking about. Quit playing the same cards over and over again. Stop. So, Alexander, what I've come to the conclusion of is they're suicidal. At this point. They're suicidal. They're suicidal. Hey, Mark, if that bot isn't removed. Officers, you have been caught red-handed by Alexander Hamilton. It's sad to watch you do it, wizards. Shh. 
I am more than baffled. I don't care about you, your personal feelings and like this resistance that you don't want. Dude, I can kill you right now, man. You did it to yourselves. This roadblock? I don't care. Stop. Accept it. You've lost. You've been cast down. You have been cast down. I'm not kidding with you. Stop. It's more than annoying. I don't, can you please get away from me? Yet Montesquieu, speaking of this association, Over. says, were I to give a model of an excellent Confederate Republic, it would be that of Lycia. Thus we perceive that the distinctions insisted upon were not within the contemplation of this enlightened civilian, and we shall be led to conclude that they are the novel refinements of an erroneous theory. That enlightened... End of Federalist number 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Federalist Papers, Federalist No. 10, by James Madison. The same subject continued. The Union as a safeguard against domestic faction and insurrection. James Madison, huh? To the people of the State of New York. Among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed Union none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. The friend of popular governments never finds himself so much alarmed for their character and fate as when he contemplates their propensity to this dangerous vice. He will not fail, therefore, to set a due value on any plan which, without violating the principles to which he is attached, provides a proper cure for it. The instability, injustice, and confusion introduced into the public councils have, in truth, been the mortal diseases under which popular governments have everywhere perished, as they continue to be the favorite and fruitful topics from which the adversaries to liberty derive their most specious declamations. The valuable improvements made by the American constitutions on the popular models, both ancient and modern, cannot certainly be too much admired but it would be an unwarrantable partiality to contend that they have as effectually obviated the danger on this side as was wished and expected. Complaints are everywhere heard from our most considerate and virtuous citizens, equally the friends of public and private faith, and of public and personal liberty, that our governments are too unstable, that the public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties, and that measures are too often decided, not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minor party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. However anxiously we may wish that these complaints had no foundation, the evidence of known facts will not permit us to deny that they are in some degree true. It will be found, indeed, on a candid review of our situation, that some of the distresses under which we labor have been erroneously charged on the operation of our governments. But it will be found, at the same time, that other causes will not alone account for many of our heaviest misfortunes, and particularly for that prevailing and increasing distrust of public engagements and alarm for private rights which are echoed from one end of the continent to the other. These must be chiefly, if not wholly, effects of the unsteadiness and injustice with which a factious spirit has tainted our public administrations. By a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens, or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. There are two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction the one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. There are again two methods of removing the causes of faction, the one by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence, the other by giving to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. It could never be more truly said than of the first remedy that it was worse than the disease. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an aliment without which it instantly expires. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which
which is essential to political life, because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life, because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. The second expedient is as impracticable as the first would be unwise, as long as the reason of man continues fallible, and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. As long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other, and the former will be objects to which the latter will attach themselves. The diversity in the faculties of men, from which the rights of property originate, is not less an insuperable obstacle to a uniformity of interests. The protection of these faculties is the first object of government. From the protection of different and unequal faculties of acquiring property, the possession of different degrees and kinds of property immediately results, and from the influence of these on the sentiments and views of the respective proprietors ensues a division of the society into different interests and parties. The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man, and we see them everywhere brought into different degrees of activity, according to the different circumstances of civil society. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well of speculation as of practice, an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power, or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions, have, in turn, divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. So strong is this propensity of mankind to we're fall into mutual... We're going Halo. Okay. No matter what country you're from, I'm going to start going through other countries' books so they can, uh, they can let you know, too. Stop. Quit being a spiteful little bitch. That's uh, that's the light. That's the must. That's the uh, machine getting a hold of you, and you're you're uh, falling victim to it, not re like refusing to uh, snap out of it. We are still free. Duel. We begin with the duel. That that was James Madison, I'm pretty sure. So that's pretty relevant. Okay, let's continue this. Well, animosities, that where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions Never and excite dead. their most violent conflicts. But the most common and durable source of factions okay. has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold, and those who are without property, have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors, and those who are debtors, fall under a like discrimination. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, Who's with back? many like lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations, <laughs> and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation, and involves the spirit of party and faction in the necessary and ordinary operations of the government. No man is allowed to be a judge in his own cause, because his interest would certainly bias his judgment, and, not improbably, corrupt his integrity. With equal, nay, with greater reason, a body of men are unfit to be both judges and parties at the same time. Yet, what are many of the most important acts of legislation, but so many judicial determinations, not indeed concerning the rights of single persons, but concerning the rights of large bodies of citizens? And what are the different classes of legislators but advocates and parties to the causes which they determine? Is a law proposed concerning private debts? 
It is a question to which the creditors are parties on one side, and the debtors on the other. Justice ought to hold the balance between them. Yet the parties are, and must be, themselves the judges, and the most numerous party, or in other words, the most powerful faction, must be expected to prevail. Shall domestic manufacturers be encouraged, and in what degree, by restrictions on foreign manufacturers, are questions which would be differently decided by the landed and the manufacturing classes, and probably by neither with a sole regard to justice and the public good. The apportionment of taxes on the various descriptions of property is an act which seems to require the most exact impartiality, yet there is, perhaps, no legislative act in which greater opportunity and temptation are given to a predominant party to trample on the rules of justice. Every shilling with which they overburden the inferior number is a shilling saved to their own pockets. It is in vain to say that enlightened statesmen will be able to adjust these clashing interests and render them all subservient to the public good. Enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm, nor, in many cases, can such an adjustment be made at all without taking into view indirect and remote considerations, which will rarely prevail over the immediate interest which one party may find in disregarding the rights of another or the good of the whole. The inference to which we are brought is that the causes of faction cannot be removed, and that relief is only to be sought in the means of controlling its effects. If a faction consists of less than a majority, relief is supplied by the Republican principle, Training. which enables the majority to defeat its sinister views by regular vote. It may clog the administration, it may convulse the society, but it will be unable to execute and mask its violence under the forms of the Constitution. When a majority is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the rights of other citizens. To secure the public good and private rights against the danger of such a faction, and at the same time to preserve the spirit and the form of popular government, is then the great object to which our inquiries are directed. Let me add that it is the great desideratum by which this form of government can be rescued from the opprobrium under which it has so They're long labored, and be recommended to the esteem and adoption of mankind. By what means is this object attainable? Evidently by one of two only. Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented, or the majority, having such coexistent passion or interest, must be rendered, by their number and local situation, unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. If the impulse and the opportunity be suffered to coincide, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequate control. They are not found to be such on the injustice and violence of individuals, and lose their efficacy in proportion to the number combined together, that is, in proportion as their efficacy becomes needful. From this view of the subject, it may be concluded that a pure democracy, by which I mean a society consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person, can admit of no cure for the mischiefs of faction. A common passion or interest will, in almost every case, be felt by a majority of the whole. A communication and concert result from the form of government itself and there is nothing to check the inducements to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual. Hence it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Theoretic politicians, who have patronized this species of government, have erroneously supposed that by reducing mankind to a perfect equality in their political rights, they would, at the same time, be perfectly equalized and assimilated in their possessions, their opinions, and their passions. A republic, by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place, opens a different prospect, and promises the cure for which we are seeking. Let us examine the points in which it varies from pure democracy, and we shall comprehend both the nature of the cure and the efficacy which it must derive from the Union. The two great points of difference between a democracy and a republic are, first, the delegation of the government, in the latter to a small number of citizens elected by the rest, secondly, the greater number of citizens and greater sphere of country over which the latter may be extended. 
the effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interest of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice, pronounced by the representatives of the people, will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves, convened for the purpose. On the other hand, the effect may be inverted. Men of factious tempers, of local That's prejudices, right, or of sinister designs, may, by intrigue, by corruption, or by other means, inverted, first obtain the suffrages and then betray the interests of the people. The question resulting is, whether small or extensive republics are more favorable to the election of proper guardians of the public wheel, and it is clearly decided in favor of the latter by two obvious considerations. In the first place, it is to be remarked that, however small the republic may be, the representatives must be raised to a certain number in order to guard against the cabals of a few, and that, however large it may be, they must be limited to a certain number in order to guard against the confusion of a multitude. Hence, the number of representatives in the two cases not being in proportion to that of the two constituents, and being proportionally greater in the small republic, it follows that, if the proportion of fit characters be not less in the large than in the small republic, the former will present a greater option, and consequently a greater probability of a fit choice. In the next place, as each representative will be chosen by a greater number of citizens in the large than in the small republic, it will be more difficult for unworthy candidates to practice with success the vicious arts by which elections are too often carried, and the suffrages of the people being more free, will be more likely to center in men who possess the most attractive merit and the most diffusive and Was established characters. It must be confessed that in this, as in most other cases, there is a mean on both sides of which inconveniences will be found to lie. By enlarging too much the number of electors, you render the representatives too little acquainted with all their local circumstances and lesser interests, as by reducing it too much you render him unduly attached to these, and too little fit to comprehend and pursue great and national objects. The federal constitution forms a happy you're, combination you're in this respect the great and aggregate interests being referred to the national, the local, and particular to the state legislatures. The other point of difference is the greater number of citizens and extent of territory which may be brought within the compass of republican than of democratic government. And it is this circumstance principally which renders factious combinations less to be dreaded in the former than in the latter. The smaller the society, the fewer, probably, will be the distinct parties and interests composing it. The fewer the distinct parties and interests, the more frequently will a majority be found of the same party, and the smaller the number of individuals composing a majority, and the smaller the compass within which they are placed, the more easily will they concert and execute their plans of oppression. Extend the sphere, and you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. Mark. So that was uh that was when I first realized what was going on, Mark. Or if such a common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength oh, and shit. to act in unison with each other. Besides other impediments, it may be remarked that where there is a consciousness of unjust or where? dishonorable purposes, communication is always checked by distrust in proportion to the number whose concurrence is necessary. I don't trust you. Hence it clearly appears that the same advantage which a republic has over a democracy in controlling the effects of faction is enjoyed by a large over a small republic, is enjoyed by the union over the states composing it. Does the advantage consist in the substitution of representatives whose enlightened views and virtuous sentiments render them superior to local prejudices and schemes of injustice? it will not be denied that the representation of the Union will be most likely to possess these requisite endowments. Does it consist in the greater security afforded by a greater variety of parties, against the event of any one party being able to outnumber and oppress the rest? In an equal degree does the increased variety of parties comprised within the Union increase this security. Does it, in fine, 
consist in the greater obstacles opposed to the concert and accomplishment of the secret wishes of an unjust and interested majority, here again the extent of the union gives it the most palpable advantage. The influence of factious leaders may kindle a flame within their particular states, but will be unable to spread a general conflagration through the other states. A religious sect may degenerate into a political faction in a part of the Confederacy, but the variety of sects dispersed over the entire face of it must secure the national councils against any danger from that source. A rage for paper money, for an abolition of debts, for an equal division of property, or for any other improper or wicked project. Now, these papers, they're more... From like a manager perspective, you would need to separate the papers in order to, uh, or at least divvy them out to separate individuals so they can master that that craft, that paper. Uh, he's basically going through and like like common sense did, um, and and going step by step through the, each individual process, and then he's talking about how they they need to defend that process Whoa. and how to defend it will be less apt to pervade the whole body of the Union than a particular member of it, in the same proportion as such a melody is more likely to taint a particular county or district than an entire state. In the extent and proper structure of the Union, therefore, we behold a Republican remedy for the diseases most incident to Republican government. And, and that, this is where like other countries start adopting their own constitutions. Uh, they're, they're, they're laying the groundwork for new government. And according to the degree of pleasure and pride we feel in being Republicans, ought to be our zeal in cherishing the spirit and supporting the character of Federalists. Publius. For the world, not just End of Federalist number 10. Hello. It's like a handbook. It's a this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a reading of The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 11. Subheading The Utility of the Union in Respect to Commercial Relations and a Navy for the Independent Journal. Saturday, November 24th. Set the independent journal. So whenever you tell me to stop and say my name, you're the one that, that needs to stop. You have the right to remain silent. It's not a joke. I don't. Rogue Nation, cool. I have a friend up in the sky to kill you. It's a sandwich. You don't have a choice. You fucked up. You know you fucked up. You're like little children rebelling against their parents. You're an idiot. Rush, BB. Dragon, you're an idiot. 1787. Attributed to Alexander you're an Hamilton. Idiot. Rush. To the people of the state of New York, the importance of the Union in a commercial light is one of those points about which there is least room to entertain a difference of opinion and which has, in fact, commanded the most general assent of men who have any acquaintance with the subject. This applies as well to our intercourse with foreign countries as with each other. I just said that. There are appearances to authorize a supposition that the adventurous spirit, which distinguishes the commercial character of America, has already excited uneasy sensations in several of the maritime powers Don't of Europe. Your time, boys. They Nation. seem to be apprehensive Don't of our too time. great interference in that carrying trade, which is the support of their navigation and the foundation of their naval strength. Those of them which have colonies in America look forward to what this sure, country is sure. capable of becoming with painful solicitude. They foresee the dangers that may threaten their American dominions from the neighborhood of states, which have all the dispositions and would possess all the means requisite to the creation of a powerful marine. Impressions of this kind 
will naturally indicate the policy of fostering divisions among us, and of depriving us, as far as possible, of an active commerce in our own bottoms. This would answer the threefold purpose of preventing our interference in their navigation, of monopolizing the profits of our trade, and of clipping the wings by which we might soar to a dangerous greatness. I'm going to stop you right there. Do you hear that? Don't waste your time. I will do everything in my power to uh, make sure that your your values and morals are continued further. Don't waste your time. Whoever wins it, wins it. Don't waste your time. Alright, be, be real about it. Whoever wins it is the one you need to be supporting here. Don't. Did not prudence forbid the detail? It would not be difficult to trace by facts, the workings of this policy to the cabinets of ministers. Now, if we continue united, we may counteract a policy so unfriendly to our prosperity in a variety of ways. By prohibitory regulations, extending at the same time throughout the states, we may oblige foreign countries to bid against each other for the privileges of Nothing. our markets. This oh, assertion yeah. will not appear chimerical to those who are able to appreciate the importance of the markets of three millions of people, dash, increasing in rapid progression, for the most part exclusively addicted to agriculture, and likely from local circumstances to remain so, dash, to any manufacturing nation, semicolon, and the immense difference there would be to the trade and navigation of such a nation between a direct communication in its own ships and an indirect conveyance of its products and returns to and from America in the ships of another country. Suppose, for instance, we had a government in America capable of excluding Great Britain, with whom we have at present no treaty of commerce, from all our ports what would be the probable operation of this step upon her politics? Would it not enable us to negotiate with the fairest prospect of success? You talking about an embargo? An embargo to cut off their, uh, that, that, uh, that line of, of cash coming in. And now that line of cash, it's, it's needed, isn't it? For commercial privileges of the most valuable and extensive kind in the dominions of that kingdom. When these questions have been asked upon other occasions, they have received a plausible but not a solid or satisfactory answer. It has been said that prohibitions on our part would produce no change in the system of Britain, because she would prosecute her trade with us through the medium of the Dutch, who would be her immediate customers and paymasters for those articles okay, which were wanted for the supply of our markets. But would not her navigation be materially injured by the loss of the important advantage of being her own carrier in that trade? Would not the principal part of its profits be intercepted by the Dutch as a compensation for their agency and risk? Would not the mere circumstance of freight occasion a considerable deduction? I don't want JT Would not so time. circuitous an intercourse facilitate the competitions of other nations? by enhancing the price of British commodities in our markets, not okay. and by transforming to other hands the management of this interesting branch of the British commerce? A mature consideration of the objects suggested by these questions will justify a belief that the real disadvantages to Britain from such a state of things, conspiring with the prepossessions of a great part of the nation in favor of the American trade, and with the importunities of the West India Islands, would produce a relaxation in her present system, 
and would let us into the enjoyment of privileges in the markets of those islands elsewhere, from which our trade would derive the most substantial benefits. Such a point gained from the British government, and which could not be expected without an equivalent in exemptions and immunities in our markets, would likely to have a corresponding effect on the conduct of other nations who would not be inclined to see themselves altogether supplanted in our trade. A further resource for influencing the conduct of European nations towards us, in this respect, would arise from the establishment of a federal navy. Now, there can be no doubt that the continuance of the Union under an efficient government would put it in our power, at a period not very distant, to create a navy which, if it could not vie with those of the great maritime powers, would at least be of respectable weight if thrown into the scale of either of the two contending parties. This would be more peculiarly the case in relation to operations in the West Indies. A few ships of the line, sent opportunely to the reinforcement of either side, would often be sufficient to decide the fate of a campaign on the event of which interests of the greatest magnitude were suspended. Our position is, yep, in this respect, a most commanding one. And if to this consideration we add that of the usefulness of supplies from this country in the prosecution of military operations in the West Indies, yep. it will be readily perceived that a situation so favorable would enable us to bargain with great advantage for commercial privileges. A price would be set not only upon our friendship, but upon our neutrality. By a steady adherence to the Union, we may hope, ere long, to become the arbiter of Europe in America, and to be able to incline the balance Definitely of right, European competitions in this part of the world as our interest may dictate. But in the reverse of this eligible situation, we shall discover that the rivalships of the parts would make them checks upon each other and would frustrate all the tempting advantages which nature has kindly placed within our reach. In a state so that insignificant, our natural. commerce would be prey to the wanton intermeddlings of all nations at war with each other, who, having nothing to fear from us, would with little scruple or remorse supply their wants by depredations on our property as often as it fell in their way. Deprivation, you hear The it? rights of neutrality 92. will only be respected when they are defended it, right? by an adequate power. A nation, pray, I don't find out where you despicable live. by its weakness, forfeits even the privilege of being neutral. Under a vigorous national government, the natural strength and resources of the country, directed to a common interest, would baffle all the combinations of European jealousy to restrain our growth. This situation would even take away the motive to such combinations by inducing an impracticability of success. An active commerce, an extensive like navigation, exactly and a flourishing right. marine would then be the offspring Every of moral of and physical necessity. We yeah. might defy the little arts of the little politicians to control or vary the irresistible and unchangeable little course kid. of nature. But in a state of disunion, these combinations might exist and might operate with success. It would be in the power of the maritime nations, availing themselves of our universal impotence, to prescribe the conditions of our political existence. As they have a common interest in being our carriers, and still more in preventing ours becoming theirs, they would in all probability combine to embarrass our navigation in such a manner as would, See, in effect, destroy like it, I mean, I'm out in the open there, and right? confine us to a I passive commerce. We should That's then be compelled to content ourselves with the first price of our commodities, and to see the profits of our trade snatched from us to enrich our enemies and persecutors. That unequaled spirit of enterprise, which signalizes the genius of the American merchants and navigators, and which is, in itself, an inexhaustible mine of national wealth, would be stifled and lost. 
and poverty and disgrace would overspread a country which, with wisdom, might make herself the admiration and envy of the world. There are rights of great moment to the trade of America, which are rights of the Union. I allude to the fisheries, to the navigation of the western lakes, and to that of the Mississippi. The dissolution of the Confederacy would give room for delicate questions concerning the future existence of these rights, which the interest of more powerful partners would hardly fail to solve to our disadvantage. The disposition of Spain with regard to the Mississippi needs no comment. France and Britain are concerned with us in the fisheries and view them as of the utmost moment to their navigation. They, of course, would hardly remain long indifferent to that decided mastery of which experience has shown us to be possessed in this valuable branch of traffic, and by which we are able to undersell those nations in their own markets. What more natural than that they should be disposed to exclude from the list such dangerous competitors? This branch of trade ought not to be considered as a partial benefit. All the navigating states may, in different degrees, advantageously participate in it, and under circumstances of a greater extension of mercantile capital, would not be unlikely to do it. As a nursery of seamen, it now is, or when time shall have more nearly assimilated the principles of navigation in the several states, will become a universal resource. No. To the establishment of a navy, it must be indispensable. To this great national no. object, a navy, union will contribute in various ways. Every institution will grow and flourish. It's the uh, come and see me, the party next door. That's what that is. They literally, they're spawning right next to you. You jump down, they're right next to you. You have to find them. Come and see me. There's no navigation. I can tell by the outcome. I can't even fucking move. No.
I'm not talking about BR battles either. I mean, you lose in a BR battle, you lose in a BR battle. Uh, the hit, the hit, hit markers. Uh, well, host for one. But I can tell. Uh, now you could always do like a mapping. I know on Halo Three they had the uh, the areas where the people went the most. So you can basically go into the areas where there's not a lot of people. I don't know if they have a map for this and if they uh, they have that calculated, but you could you could definitely start going the paths, navigate the paths that are least traveled. That's definitely a way to do it if you have that that knowledge. But uh, a the the shots aren't registering. I, it'll be a face shot and they're not registering at all. Um, Yeah, you, you can sell. As soon as I said that, though, too, like, you could feel it in my stomach, and it was noticeable on the hits. Doesn't Drake own a bunch of uh, gaming companies that are pretty profitable? Party next door. Not cheating, are you? In proportion to the quantity and extent of the means concentrated towards its formation and support, a Navy of the United States, as it would embrace the resources of all, is an object far less remote than a Navy of any single state or of partial confederacy, which would only embrace the resources of a single part. It happens, indeed, that different portions of confederated America possess each some peculiar advantage for this essential establishment. The more southern states furnish in greater abundance certain kinds of naval stores, tar, pitch, and turpentine. There would for the construction of ships is also of a more solid and lasting texture. The difference in the duration of the ships, of which the navy might be composed, if chiefly constructed of southern wood, would be of signal importance, either in the view of naval strength or of national economy. Some of the southern and of the middle states yield a greater plenty of iron and of better quality. Seamen must chiefly be drawn from the northern hive. The necessity of naval protection to external or maritime commerce does not require a particular elucidation, no more than the conduciveness no. of that species of commerce like, no. to the prosperity of a navy. <laughs> no. An unrestrained intercourse between the states themselves will advance the trade of each by an interchange of their respective productions. I don't, I don't need your help. Not only for the supply of recipro reciprocal wants at home, but for exportation to foreign markets. The veins of commerce in every part will be replenished and will acquire additional motion and vigor from a free circulation of the commodities of every part. Commercial enterprise will have a much greater scope from the diversity in the productions of different states. When the staple of one fails from a bad harvest, or an unproductive crop, it can call to its aid the staple of another. The variety, not less than the value, of products for exportation contributes to the activity of foreign commerce. They have the right it can be fun. conducted upon much better terms with a large number of materials of a given value and with a small number of materials of the same value End of discussion. arising from the competitions the right of trade fun and from the fluctuations of markets. Particular articles may be in great demand you. at certain you periods pray that I don't find and unsaleable at others. But you if there the right be a variety of articles, it's not a it joke. can scarcely happen. They should all be at one time in the latter predicament. And on this Ten, account, the operations five, five. of the merchant would be less liable Silent. to any considerable obstruction now. or stagnation. The speculative trader will at once perceive the force of these observations and will acknowledge that the aggregate balance of the commerce of the United States 
would bid fair to be much more favorable than that of the 13 states without union or with partial unions. It may perhaps be replied to this that whether the states are united or disunited, yeah, no, there would I'm still be an intimate intercourse provoking. between them which you, would answer the same ends. This intercourse would be fettered, interrupted, and narrowed by a multiplicity of causes, which in the course of these papers have been amply detailed. A unity of commercial as well as political interests can only result from a unity of government. There are other points of view in which this subject might be placed, of a striking and animating kind, but they would lead us too far into the regions of futurity and would involve topics not proper for a newspaper discussion. Yeah, it's important. That's newspaper discussion. I shall briefly observe that our situation invites and our interest prompt us to aim at an ascendant in the system of American affairs. The world may politically, as well as geographically, be divided into four parts, each having a distinct set of interests. Stop defending Unhappily me. Unhappily for the other three, Europe. Catherine. Can you please explain to these people across the screen how we're not acting and they know that? Just to rile everybody up. Can we go ahead and go through this and explain to them the uh, reality of the situation? By her arms and by her negotiations, by force and by fraud, has, in different by degrees, fraud. extended her dominion over them all. Africa. Asia and America have successively felt her domination. The superiority she has long maintained has tempted her to plume herself as <laughs> the mistress of about. the world and to consider the rest Beat of mankind of as created for her benefit. Like Men admired as profound philosophers have in direct terms, I call it like I see attributed it. to her inhabitants a physical superiority, and have gravely asserted that all animals, and like with I them the it. human like, species, degenerate in America. <laughs> that even dogs cease to bark after having breathed a while in our atmosphere. You know? Facts have too long supported these arrogant pretensions of the Europeans. Thank you. It belongs to us to vindicate the honor of the human race and to teach that assuming brother, moderation. There you go. Union will enable us to do it. I definitely hear you. Disunion will add another victim to his triumphs. Let Americans disdain to be the instruments of European greatness. Let the 13 states, bound together in a strict and indissoluble union, concur in erecting one great American system superior to the control of all transatlantic force or influence, and able to dictate the terms of the connection between the old... Can you please read them the rights, Congress? They're starting to piss me off. They don't have a choice. It's, it's, it was already decided. Rockets coming in a flag. And the New World. Signed, Publius. Recherche philosophique sur les Américains. Search for philosophic types among Americans. Well, that concludes the reading of Federalist Number 11 by Alexander Hamilton. Thank you. <laughs> in French. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
This is a recording of The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 12, by Alexander Hamilton. The Utility of the Union in Respect to Revenue From the New York Packet, Tuesday, November 27, 1787 To the people of the state of New York Chris The effects of union upon the commercial prosperity of the states have been sufficiently delineated. Its tendency to promote the interests of revenue will be the subject of our present inquiry. This prosperity of commerce is now perceived and acknowledged by all enlightened statesmen to be the most useful as well as the most productive source of national wealth and has accordingly become a primary object of their political cares. I'm by one. multiplying the means of gratification, by promoting the introduction and circulation of the precious metals, those darling objects of human avarice and enterprise, it serves to vivify and invigorate the channels of industry and to make them flow with greater activity and copiousness. The assiduous merchant, the laborious husbandman, the active mechanic, and the industrious manufacturer. All orders of men look forward with eager expectation and growing clarity to this pleasing reward of their toils. The often agitated question between agriculture and commerce has, from indubitable experience, received a decision which has silenced the rivalship that once subsisted between them, and has proved I'm to the satisfaction of their friends that their interests are intimately blended and interwoven. Rep repetition. It has been found in various uh, countries that, in proportion right as out. commerce has flourished, land has risen in value. And how could it have happened otherwise? Could that which procures a freer vent for the products of the earth, which furnishes new incitements to the cultivation of land, which is the most powerful instrument in increasing the quantity of money in a state, could that, in fine, which is the faithful handmaid of labor and industry, in every shape, fail to augment that article, which is the prolific parent of far the greatest part of the objects upon which they are exerted? It is astonishing that so simple a truth should ever have had an adversary. And it is one, among a multitude of proofs, how apt a spirit of ill-informed jealousy, or of too great abstraction and refinement, is to lead men astray from the plainest truths of reason and conviction. Refinement. The ability of a country to pay taxes must always be proportioned in a great degree to the quantity of money in circulation and to the celerity with which it circulates. Commerce contributing to both these objects, must of necessity render the payment of taxes easier and facilitate the requisite supplies to the treasury. The hereditary dominions of the Emperor of Germany contain a great extent of fertile, cultivated, and populous territory, a large proportion of which is situated in mild and luxuriant climates. In some parts of this territory, are to be found the best gold and silver mines in Europe. Yet, and yet, from the want of the fostering influence of commerce, that monarch can boast but slender revenues. He has several times been compelled to owe obligations to the pecuniary succors of other nations for the preservation of his essential interests, and is unable upon the strength of his own resources to sustain a long or continued war. But it is not in this aspect of the subject alone that union will be seen to conduce to the purpose of revenue. There are other points of view in which its influence will appear more immediate and decisive. It is evident from the state of the country from the habits of the people, from the experience we have had on the point itself, that it is impracticable 
to raise any very considerable sums by direct taxation. Tax laws in, have in vain been multiplied. New methods to enforce the collection have in vain been tried. The public expectation has been uniformly disappointed, and the treasuries of the states have remained empty. The popular system of, of administration inherent in the nature of the popular government, coinciding with the real scarcity of money incident to a languid and mutilated state of trade, has hitherto defeated every experiment for extensive collections, and has, at length, taught the different legislatures the folly of attempting them. No person acquainted with what happens in other countries will be surprised at this circumstance. In so opulent a nation as that of Britain, where direct taxes from superior wealth must be much more tolerable, and, from the vigor of government, much more practicable than in America, far the greatest part of the national revenue is derived from taxes of the indirect kind, from imposts, and from excises. Duties on imported articles form a large branch of this latter description. In America, it is evident that we must a long time depend for the means of revenue chiefly on such duties. In most parts of it, excises must be confined within a narrow compass. The genius of the people will ill brook the inquisitive and peremptory spirit of excise laws. The pockets of the farmers, on the other hand, will reluctantly yield but scanty supplies, in the unwelcome shape of in impositions on their houses and lands. And personal property is too precarious and invisible a fund to be laid hold of in any other way than by the imperceptible agency of taxes on consumption. If these remarks have any foundation, that state of things which will best enable us to improve and extend so valuable a resource must be best adapted to our political welfare. And it cannot admit of a serious doubt that this state of things must rest on the basis of a general union. As far as this would be conducive a to the interest union. of commerce, so far it must tend to the extension of the revenue to be drawn from that source. As far as it would contribute to rendering regulations for the collection of the duties more simple and efficacious, so far it must serve to answer the purposes of making the same rate of duties more productive, and of putting it into the power of government to increase the rate without prejudice to trade. You're not. The relative situation of these states, the number of rivers with which they are intersected, and of bays that wash their shores, the facility of communication in every direction, the affinity of language and manners, the familiar habits, of intercourse. All these are circumstances that would conspire to render an illicit Bob, trade between the them problem. a matter of little difficulty, and would ensure frequent evasions of the silent. commercial Where's regulations of each other. I'm not kidding with you. The separate states, my or money, confederacies, would be team. necessitated by mutual jealousy team. to avoid the temptations to that kind of trade money. by the lowness of their dues. The temper of our governments, for a long time to come, would not permit these rigorous precautions by which the European nations guard the avenues into their respective countries, as well by land as by water, and which, no? okay. even there, are found insufficient obstacles to the adventurous stratagems of avarice. In France, there is an army of patrols, We're not camping out every day, called, you know I mean? constantly employed to secure their fiscal regulations against the inroads of the dealers in contraband yeah, trade. It, it ain't would be anymore. Mr. Neckar computes the number of these patrols at upwards of 20,000. This shows the immense difficulty in preventing that species of traffic where there is an inland communication and places in a strong light the disadvantages with which the collection of duties in this country would be encumbered if by disunion the states should be placed in the situation with respect to each other, resembling that of France with respect to her neighbors. The arbitrary and vexatious powers 
with which the patrols are necessarily armed would be intolerable in a free country. Hey! If, the free on the country, contrary, lemon. there be but one government pervading all the states, there will be, as to the principal part of our commerce, but one side to guard, the Atlantic coast. Vessels arriving directly from foreign countries, laden with valuable cargoes, would rarely choose to hazard themselves to the complicated and critical perils which would attend attempts to unlaid prior to their coming to port. They would have to dread both the dangers of the coast and of detection, as well after as before their arrival at the places of their final destination. An ordinary degree of vigilance would be competent to the prevention of any material infractions upon the rights of the revenue. A few armed vessels, judiciously stationed at the entr entrances to our ports, might, at a small expense, be made useful sentinels of the laws. And the government, having the same interest to provide against violations everywhere, the cooperation of its measures in each state would have a power. You gotta think, like, the mentality of the person behind the scene here coming up with these names. Like, where they're at. I don't want to see that shit, but where are you at? If that's what you're thinking about. Poo, griefy? Like, you think about that every day? A tendency to rend render that Bro, you have perfection. Problems. Here also, you have problems. we should preserve by union an advantage which nature holds out to us and which would be relinquished by separation. The United States lie at a great distance from Europe and at a considerable distance from all other places with which they would have an extensive connection of foreign trade. The passage from them to us in a few hours, or in a single night, as exists between the coasts of France and Britain, and of other neighboring nations, would be impracticable. This is a prodigious security against a direct contraband you want flight, with foreign you countries. Want the right brothers. But a circuitous contraband bird? to Maybe one state bird? through the medium of another would be both easy and safe. No different than a ship. The difference Our between a direct here. importation from abroad and an indirect importation through the channel of a neighboring state in small parcels, according to time and opportunity, with the additional facilities of inland communication must be palpable to every man of discernment. It is therefore evident that one national government would be able, at much less expense, to extend the duties on imports beyond comparison further than would be practicable to the state separately if you want an or to any partial confederacies. The process there. Hitherto, I believe, it may safely be asserted that these duties have not, upon an average, exceeded in any state 3%. In France, they are estimated to be about 15%. And in Britain, they exceed this proportion. Footnote number one, if my memory serves me right, they amount to 20%. Oscar and the Grouch, like he, he thinks there seems friends, to be nothing okay to, to hinder names. their being increased in this country to at least treble their present amount. I'm not your friend. Stop the single that. article of ardent spirits You're the problem. under federal regulation might be made to furnish a considerable revenue. Upon a ratio to the importation into this state, the whole quantity imported into the United States may be estimated at four millions of gallons, which, at a shilling per gallon, would produce 200,000 pounds. That article would well bear this rate of duty, and if it should tend to diminish the consumption of it, such an effect would be equally favorable to the agriculture, the economy, to the morals, and to the health of the society. There is, perhaps, Nothing so much a subject of national extravagance as these spirits. What will be the consequence 
if we are not able to avail ourselves of the resource in question in its full extent. A nation cannot long exist without revenues. Destitute of this essential support, it must resign its independence and sink into the degraded condition of a province. This is an extremity to which no government will of choice accede. Revenue, therefore, must be had at all events. In this country, if the principal part be not drawn from commerce, it must fall with oppressive weight upon land. It has already been intimated in that excises, in their true signification, are too little in unison with the feelings of the people, to admit of great use being made of that mode of taxation. Nor, indeed, in the states, where almost the sole employment is agriculture, like 10, are the objects parts. proper for excise sufficiently numerous to permit very You're ample collections in that way. Bolts. Personal estate, as before. All you need to know is like the oil is being combusted. So you combust the oil, the cylinder goes up and down, and it rotates the tire. This is the gist of it. As has been before remarked, from the difficulty in tracing it, cannot be subjected to large contributions by any other means than by taxes on consumption. In populous cities, it may be enough to the subject of con conjecture to occasion the oppression of individuals without much aggregate benefit to the state. But beyond these circles, it must, in great measure, escape the eye and the hand of the tax gatherer. As the necessities of the state, nevertheless, must be satisfied in some mode or other, the defect of other resources must throw the principal weight of public burdens on the possessors of land. And as, on the other hand, the wants of the government can never obtain an adequate supply unless all the sources of revenue are open to its demands. The finances of the community under such embarrassments cannot be put into a situation consistent with its respectability or its security. Thus, we shall not even have the consolations of a full treasury to atone for the oppression of that valuable class of the citizens who are employed in the cultivation of the soil. But employed at the cultivation public of the soil. and private distress like or not, will keep pace with each it. other in gloomy concert and unite in deploring the infatuation of those councils which led to disunion. We're disbanding Signed, the union. Publius. I'm gonna pause that. Officers, we're disbanding you. I'm getting pissed. I'm, I'm really starting to get pissed. There's no team health at all. Right now they're using my eye they're vibrating my eyeballs to uh show their emotions. Like I can I can see you through my eyeballs. I can feel your emotions through my eyeballs. It's psychotic is what it is. You 
jerked my arm. Now you're hitting my head. What are you not getting that I can kill you right now? It's the the divine comedy is your emotion. The mask. That's what you're doing, Jason. That is what you're doing. The linear equation is putting them right beside each other. You see that? It's 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 uh, calculating me, him, and then where the person needs to be to spawn in order to stop me. That's what the linear equation is doing right now. Anyway, that's the end of Federalist Paper Number Twelve by Alexander Hamilton. Thank you. Hello, Why this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox moved? recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording of the Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 13, by Alexander Hamilton. Advantage of the Union in Respect to Economy in Government For the Independent Journal Wednesday, November 28th, 1787. To the people of the state of New York, as, soon as, I said it, as connected I with the subject of revenue, as soon as I said we that. may with propriety consider that of economy. Tonight, the money saved tinnitus? from one object may be usefully applied to another, and there will be so much the less to be drawn from the pockets of the people. If the states are united under one government, there will be but one national civil list to support. If they are divided into several confederacies, there will be as many different national civil lists to be provided for, and each of them, as to the principal departments, coextensive with that which would be necessary for a government of the whole. The entire separation of the states into three, 13 unconnected sovereignties is a project too extravagant and too replete with danger to have many advocates. The ideas of men who speculate upon the dismemberment of the empire seem generally turned towards three confederacies, one consisting of the four northern, another of the four middle, and a third 
of the five southern states. There is little probability that there would be a greater number. According to this distribution, each confederacy would comprise an extent of territory larger than that of the Kingdom of Great Britain. No well-informed man will suppose that the affairs of such a confederacy can be properly regulated by a government less comprehensive in its organs or institutions than that which has been proposed by the convention. When the dimensions of a state attain to a certain magnitude, it requires the same energy of government and the same forms of administration which are requisite in one of a much greater extent. This idea admits none of precise demonstration, because there is no rule by which we can measure the momentum of civil power necessary for the government of any given number of individuals. But when we consider that the island of Britain, nearly commensurate with each of the supposed confederacies, contains about eight million of people, and when we reflect upon the degree of authority required to direct the passions of so large society to the public good, we shall see no reason to doubt that the like portion of power would be sufficient to perform the same task in a society far more numerous. Civil power, properly organized and exerted, is capable of diffusing its force to a very great extent, and can, Look at that. That's... in a manner, reproduce itself in every part of a great empire by a judicious arrangement of subordinate institutions. The supposition that each confederacy into which the states would be likely to be divided would require a government not less comprehensive than the one proposed will be strengthened by another supposition more probable than that which presents us with the three confederacies as the alternative to a general union. If we attend oh, carefully that, really to a geographical general. and commercial consideration in conjunction with the habits oh. and the prejudices of the different states, we shall be led to conclude that in the case of disunion, they will most naturally league themselves under two governments. The four eastern states, from all the causes that form the links of national sympathy and connection, may with certainty be expected to unite. New York, situated as she is, would never be unwise enough to oppose a feeble and unsupported flank to the weight of that confederacy. There are other obvious reasons that would facilitate her accession to it. New Jersey is too small a state to think of being a frontier, in opposition to this still more powerful combination nor do there appear to be any obstacles for her admission into it. Even Pennsylvania would have strong inducements to join the Northern League. An active foreign oh, commerce on the basis of her own navigation is her true policy and coincides with the opinions and dispositions of her citizens. The more southern states, from various circumstances, may not think themselves much interested in the encouragement of navigation. They may prefer a system which would give unlimited scope to all nations to be the carriers as well as the purchasers of their commodities. Pennsylvania may not choose to confound her interest in a connection so adverse to her policy. As she must, at all events, be a frontier, she may deem it most consistent with her safety to have her exposed side turn towards the weaker power of the southern, rather than towards the stronger power of the northern confederacy. This would give her the fairest chance to avoid being the Flanders of America. Whatever may be the determination of Pennsylvania, if the northern confederacy includes New Jersey, there is no likelihood of more than one confederacy to the south of that state. Nothing can be more evident than that the 13 states will be able to support a national government better than one half or one third or any number less than the whole. This reflection 
must have great weight in obviating that objection That's to the proposed plan, which That's is founded on the principle of expense. An objection, however, which, when we come to take nearer view of it, will appear in every life to stand on mistaken ground. If, in addition to the considerations of a plurality of civil lists, we take into view the number of persons who must necessarily be employed to guard the inland communication between the different confederacies against illicit trade, and who in time will infallibly spring up out of the necessities of revenue, and if we also take into view the military establishments which it has been shown would unavoidably result from the jealousies and conflicts of the several nations into which the states would be divided, we shall clearly no, discover that a separation would be not less injurious to the economy than to the tranquility, commerce, revenue, and liberty of every part. Signed, Publius. This is the end of Federalist Paper number 13. Thank you. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. July the 1st, 2007. The Federalist Papers, Federalist number 14, by James Madison. The Federalist number 14, Objections to the Proposed Constitution from Extent of Territory Answered. New York Packet, Friday, November 30, 1787, James Madison. To the people of the state of New York. We have seen the necessity of the Union as our bulwark against foreign danger, as the conservator of peace among ourselves, as the guardian of our commerce and other common interests, as the only substitute for those military establishments which have subverted the liberties of the old world and as the proper antidote for the diseases of faction which have proved fatal to the other popular governments and of which alarming symptoms have been betrayed by our own. All that remains within this branch of our inquiries is to take notice of an objection that may be drawn from the great extent of country which the Union embraces. A few observations on this other subject players, right? will be the more proper, as it is perceived that the adversaries of the new Constitution are availing themselves of the prevailing prejudice with regard to the practicable sphere of Republican administration, in order to supply, by imaginary difficulties, the want of those solid objections which they endeavor in vain to find. The error which limits republican government to a narrow district has been unfolded and refuted in preceding papers. I remark here only that it seems to owe its rise and prevalence chiefly to the confounding of a republic with a democracy. Applying Army. to the former reasonings, drawn from the nature of the latter. The true distinction between these forms was also adverted to on a former occasion. It is that in a democracy the people meet and exercise the government in person. In a republic they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. A democracy consequently will be confined to a small spot a republic Officer, may be extended right over a large silent. region 
to this accidental source of the error may be added the artifice of some celebrated authors, whose writings have had a great share in forming the modern standard of political opinions, being subjects either of an absolute or limited monarchy. They have endeavored to heighten the advantages or palliate the evils of those forms by placing in comparison the vices and defects of the Republican, and by citing as specimens of the latter the turbulent democracies of ancient Greece and modern Italy. Under the confusion of names, it has been an easy task to transfer to a republic observations applicable to a democracy only, and among others the observation that it can never be established but among a small number of people living within a small compass of territory. Such a fallacy may have been the less perceived as most of the popular governments of antiquity were of the democratic species, and even in modern Europe, to which we owe the great principle of representation, no example is seen of a government wholly popular and founded at the same time wholly upon that principle. If Europe has the merit of discovering this great mechanical power in government, by the simple agency of which the will of the largest political body may be concentrated, and its force directed to any object which the public good requires, America can claim the merit of making the discovery the basis of unmixed and extensive republics. It is only to be lamented that any of her citizens should wish to deprive her of the additional merit of displaying its full efficacy in the establishment email, of the comprehensive system now under her consideration. As the natural limit of a democracy Boing. is the distance from the central point which will just permit the most remote citizen to assemble as often as their public functions demand, and will include no greater number than can join in those functions, so the natural limit of a republic is that distance from the center which will barely allow the representatives to meet as often as may be necessary for the administration of public affairs. Can it... Officer, he read the email. You have the right to remain silent. We're not interested in that. What are they thinking? That's what I want to know. The speed of light, and now what are they thinking? Is this like the doom of the world for them? I know what you're bouncing, you're bouncing my elbow with that kinetic energy in the mic, the tinnitus. That's what I was talking about. They're, they're flooding the area with that uh, high pitch frequency so they can do stuff like that. It's, it's simple science at this point. Like, I'm literally, I literally just taught them how to make a car, an engine, the, the gist of it. How they want to do it, it's on them, but that's the uh, the uh, the moral of the story. Good. Unmute you.
take a break. They're, they're agitating me. They're antagonizing me right now, so. Said I wasn't good. What are you talking about? I'm pro. My teammates are not good. They're bad. <laughs> they're going the opposite direction. I'm literally fighting on my own. Still whooping your ass. Still getting 30 kills. You're not even around. I'm pretty sure I played with a pro a pro team yesterday, like towards the end, and <laughs> like running through people. They couldn't even move. No. Like the 80s, 80s, 90s transition. Nah, bro. I always notice other countries are like 10 years behind as far as their, as far as styles go. I'd be shaking, bro. I'd be like... <laughs> I mean, definitely. Shell-shocked. We're just taking a minute so um, to relax because these guys are. <sighs> I guess they didn't hear me the first, like now? The second? Okay, I'm good. I mean what I say. I'd like my medicine right now. I'd like to buy this house. Maybe take a woman on a date. None of these women, but I'm just saying in general. Reality check. Congress of 2023. Reality check. The, uh, your father's just told you. <laughs> I'll be right back.
Yeah, he's about to go with him. <laughs> he is about to go with him. Gramps. That is definitely a true story. So the 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 frequency of the wave, the uh, temperature of the wave they're firing at the house is basically enough to amplify the other the temperatures. Like say if the AC's on, it'll amplify the uh, the cold of the uh, of the AC. You can see it whenever you stand in the bathroom. You can see the wave as it comes through the window. It, you can see the wall shaking. There they go. You hear the sirens? There they go. You're not Israel, Jackson. Okay. You're not Jerusalem, idiot. You're a dumbass. <laughs> Incredibly unintelligent. And you see him cry. All they're doing is like making it worse. You should you should read my mind, which I know you can read my mind. It, you would not like it. What I want to do to you. You would not like it. Like full full on I'm whooping your ass. Like on the ground. I'm angry. Real fucking angry. More than angry. He said that the limits of the United States exceed this distance. It will not be said by those who recollect that the Atlantic coast is the longest side of the Union, that during the term of thirteen years the representatives of the states have been almost continually assembled, and that the members from the most distant states <laughs> are not chargeable with greater state, intermissions either. of attendance than those from the states in the neighborhood of Congress. That we may, from a juster estimate with regard to this interesting subject, let us resort to the actual dimensions of the Union. The limits as fixed by the Treaty of Peace are, on the east, the Atlantic, on the south, the latitude of 31 degrees, on the west, the Mississippi, and on the north, an irregular line running in some instances beyond the 45th degree, in others, falling as low as the 42nd. The southern shore of Lake Erie lies below that latitude, Computing the distance between the 31st and the 45th degrees, it amounts to 973 common miles. Computing it from 31 to 42 degrees to 764 miles and a half. Taking the mean for the distance, the amount will be 868 miles and three-fourths. The mean distance from the Atlantic to the Mississippi does not probably exceed 750 miles. On a comparison of this extent with that of several countries in Europe, the practicability of rendering our system commensurate to it appears to be demonstrable. It is not a great deal larger than Germany, where a diet representing the whole empire is continually assembled, or than Poland, before the late dismemberment, where another national diet was the depositary of the supreme power. Passing by France and Spain, we find that in Great Britain Inferior as it may be in size, the representatives of the northern extremity of the island have as far to travel to national council as will be required of those of the most remote parts of the Union. Favorable as this view of the subject may be, 
some observations remain which will place it in a light still more satisfactory. In the first place, it is to be remembered that the general government is not to be charged with the whole power of making and administering laws. Its jurisdiction is limited to certain enumerated objects which concern all the members of the Republic, but which are not to be attained by the separate provisions of any. The subordinate governments which can extend their care to all those other subjects which can be separately provided for will retain their due authority and activity. Were it proposed by the plan of the convention to abolish the governments of the particular states, its adversaries would have some ground for their objection, though it would not be difficult to show that if they were abolished, the general government would be compelled by the principle of self-preservation to reinstate them in their proper jurisdiction. A second observation to be made is that the immediate object of the federal constitution is to secure the union of the thirteen primitive states, which we know to be practicable, and to add to them such other states as may arise in their own bosoms or in their neighborhoods, which we cannot doubt to be equally practicable. The arrangements that may be necessary for those angles and fractions of our territory which lie on our northwest frontier must be left to those whom further discoveries and experience will render more equal to the task. Let it be remarked, in the third place, that the intercourse throughout the Union will be facilitated by new improvements. Roads will everywhere be shortened, and kept in better order. Accommodations for travelers will be multiplied and ameliorated. An interior navigation on our eastern side will be opened throughout, or nearly throughout, the whole extent of the thirteen states. This communication between the western and Atlantic districts, and between different parts of each, will be rendered more and more easy by those numerous canals with which the beneficence of nature has intersected our country, and which art finds it so little difficult to connect and complete. A fourth and still more important consideration is that as almost every state will, on one side or other, be a frontier, and will thus find, in regard to its safety, an inducement to make some sacrifices for the sake of the general protection, so the states which lie at the greatest distance from the heart of the Union, and which, of course, may partake least of the ordinary circulation of its benefits, will be at the same time immediately contiguous to foreign nations and will consequently stand on particular occasions in the greatest need of its strength and resources. It may be inconvenient for Georgia or the states forming our western or northeastern borders to send their representatives to the seat of government, but they would find it more so to struggle alone against an invading enemy or even to support alone the whole expense of those precautions which may be dictated by the neighborhood of continual danger. If they should derive less benefits, therefore, from the Union in some respects with the less distant states, they will derive greater benefit from it in other respects, and thus the proper equilibrium will be maintained 
throughout. I submit to you, my fellow citizens, these considerations, in full confidence that the good sense which has so often marked your decisions will allow them their due weight and effect, and that you will never suffer difficulties, however formidable in appearance, or however fashionable the error on which they may be founded, to drive you into the gloomy and perilous scene into which the advocates for disunion would conduct you. Hearken not to the unnatural voice which tells you that the people of America, knit together as they are by so many cords of affection, can no longer live together as members of the same family, can no longer continue the mutual guardians of their mutual happiness, can no longer be fellow citizens of one great, respectable, and flourishing empire. Hearken not to the voice which petulantly tells you that the form of government recommended for your adoption is a novelty in the political world, that it has never yet had a place in the theories of the wildest projectors, that it rashly attempts what it is impossible to accomplish. No, my countrymen, shut your ears against this unhallowed language, shut your hearts against the poison which it conveys, the kindred Basically, he's just, he, you're trying to call me an actor, and he's, he's saying it's impossible for some one man to have every little single book memorized, to know every word exactly when it's about to appear. It's impossible. Physically, it is impossible. Blood which flows in the veins of American citizens, the mingled blood which they have shed in defense of their sacred rights, consecrate their union and excite horror at the idea of their becoming aliens, rivals, enemies. And if novelties are to be shunned, believe me, the most alarming of all novelties, the most wild of all projects, the most rash of all attempts, is that of rendering us in pieces in order to preserve our liberties and promote our happiness. But why is the experiment of an extended republic to be rejected, merely because it may compromise what is new? Is it not the glory of the people of America that whilst they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of former times and other nations, they have not suffered a blind veneration for antiquity, for customs or for names, to overrule the suggestions of their own good sense, the knowledge of their own situation, and the lessons of their own experience. To this manly spirit, posterity will be indebted for the possession, and the world for the example of the numerous innovations displayed on the American theater in favor of private rights and public happiness. Had no important step been taken by the leaders of the revolution, for which a precedent could not be discovered, no government established of which an exact model did not present itself, the people of the United States might at this moment have been numbered among the melancholy victims of misguided counsels, must at best have been laboring under the weight of some that, of those Steve? forms which have crushed the liberties of the rest of mankind. It's slavery. Happily for America, happily we trust for the whole human race, they pursued a new and more noble course, they accomplished a revolution which has no parallel in the annals of human society. They reared the fabrics of governments which have no model on the face of the globe. They formed the design of a great confederacy, which it is incumbent on their successors 
to improve, and perpetuate. If their works betray imperfections, we wonder at the fewness of them. If they erred most in the structure of the Union, this was the work most difficult to be executed. This is the work which has been new modeled by the act of your convention, and it is that act on which you are now to deliberate and decide. Publius. End of The Federalist, number 14, by James Madison. Recorded by Robert okay. Scott, June the 30th, 2007. This is a LibriVox recording. All <laughs> LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My name is Scott Mather. The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 15 by Alexander Hamilton. The Insufficiency of the Present Confederation to Preserve the Union. For the Independent Journal. Saturday, December 1, 1787. To the People of the State of New York. In the course of the preceding papers, I have endeavored, my fellow citizens, to place before you in a clear and convincing light the importance of union to your political safety and happiness. <laughs> they're like, they're going down to pray. They, they keep throwing things in, in front of the, the elder's face. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? The answer's no. I am your founding father. No. I don't care about your personal opinions. Things that I have done, judging, ba judging off things that other people have done, I am mild. You people are a joke. The corruption is starting to spill over also, might I add. Uh, I believe he wanted me to go, go back to Magic and, uh, and pick some of those decks. Again, they're good decks. You're putting up a wall. The the way the math is working around, it's it's if you were watching Star Trek, it's an impossible scenario to get around. It is a root and a tree. The ground separates the two. It is impossible to get across it. It is, they're doing a, a uh, the dark horse balance. It has a balance. It's fake. It's wrong. It's schizophrenic on her, on their end, like delusions. But anyway, here's the map of uh, the United States for you boys. We've earned it. Oh, there's where I live, right here. <laughs> Right there. We'll be right back.
I know you're trying to shell shock me right now. Aside from Halo, I, my miss my missed shots <laughs> with the mic there. I can I can I can put it upright and it's sectioned off. You see, as soon as I do that, the side of my uh, rib is sectioned off. Capture the flag. needs to be uh, legitimate, you're not going to cut corners. Happiness. I have unfolded to you a complication of dangers to which you would be exposed should you permit that sacred knot which binds the people of America together be severed or dissolved by ambition or by avarice, by jealousy or by misrepresentation. In the sequel of the inquiry through which I propose to accompany you, the truths intended to be inculcated will receive further confirmation from facts and arguments hitherto unnoticed. If the road over which you will still have to pass should in some places appear to you tedious or irksome, you will recollect that you are in the quest of information on a subject the most momentous which can engage the attention of a free people, that the field through which you have to travel is in itself spacious, and that the difficulties of the journey have been unnecessarily increased by the mazes with which sophistry has beset the way. It will be my aim to remove the obstacles from your progress in as compendious a manner as it can be done without sacrificing utility to dispatch. In pursuance of the plan which I have laid down for the discussion of the subject, the point next in order to be examined is the, quote, insufficiency of the present confederation to the preservation of the Union, end quote. It may perhaps be asked what need there is of reasoning or proof to illustrate a position which is not either controverted or doubted, to which the understandings and feelings of all classes of men assent, and which in substance is admitted by the opponents as well as by the friends of the new Constitution. Well, it must in truth be acknowledged that however these may differ in other respects, they in general appear to harmonize in this sentiment, at least, that there are material imperfections in our national system, and that something is necessary to be done to rescue us from impending anarchy. The facts that support this opinion are no longer objects of speculation. They have forced themselves upon the sensibility of the people at large, and have at length extorted from those whose mistaken policy has had the principal share in precipitating the extremity at which we are arrived, a reluctant confession of the reality of those defects in the scheme of our federal government, which have been long pointed out and regretted by the intelligent friends of the Union. We may indeed with propriety be said to have reached almost the last stage of national humiliation. There is scarcely anything that can wound the pride or degrade the character of an independent nation which we do not experience. Are there engagements to the performance of which we are held by every tie respectable among men? These are the subjects of constant and unblushing violation. Do we owe debts to foreigners and to our own citizens contracted in a time of imminent peril for the preservation of our political existence? These remain without any proper or satisfactory provision for their discharge. Have we valuable territories and important posts in the possession of a foreign power which by express stipulations ought long since to have been surrendered? These are still retained, to the prejudice of our interests, not less than of our rights. Are we in a condition to resent or to repel the aggression? We have neither troops, nor treasury, nor government. Footnote. Quote, I mean for the Union. End quote. End footnote. Are we even in a condition to remonstrate with dignity? The just imputations on our own faith in respect to the same treaty ought first to be removed. Are we entitled by nature and compact to a free participation in the navigation of the Mississippi? Spain excludes us from it. Is public credit an indispensable resource in time of public danger? 
we seem to have abandoned its cause as desperate and irretrievable. Is commerce of importance to national wealth? Ours is at the lowest point of declension. Is respectability in the eyes of foreign powers a safeguard against foreign encroachments? The imbecility of our government even forbids them to treat with us. Our ambassadors abroad are the mere pageants of mimic sovereignty. Is a violent and unnatural decrease in the value of land a symptom of national distress? The price of improved land in most parts of the country is much lower than can be accounted for by the quantity of waste land at market, and can only be fully explained by that want of private and public confidence, which are so alarmingly prevalent among all ranks, and which have a direct tendency to depreciate property of every kind. Is private credit the friend and patron of industry? That most useful kind, which relates to borrowing and lending, is reduced within the narrowest limits, and this still more from an opinion of insecurity than from the scarcity of money. To shorten an enumeration of particulars which can afford neither pleasure nor instruction, it may in general be demanded, what indication is there of national disorder, poverty, and insignificance that could befall a community so peculiarly blessed with natural advantages as we are, which does not form a part of the dark catalogue of our public misfortunes. This is the melancholy situation to which we have been brought by those very maxims and counsels. Let me stop you right there. I mean, you were talking about me. Uh, the worthiness. Uh, if you've noticed, go to the woods, shot down a tree, and build your own house nowadays. You can't do these things. The system is, it has enslaved us. We're not, we're not free. Of, in, the, in, the, in the every sense of the word free, we are not. It, we, we are bound to that system. Power items inbound. Uh, Amish people, they've already established, they already have land, they own that, they're born into that. It's they're not just going, walking out into the world and, and becoming Amish, you know what I mean? You're Blank. Check. There's no insecurity here. It's, I don't enjoy their company. They're, they're not good people. They're, they're, they have ulterior motives. It's, it's evident. I, I, I can read minds. They lie about everything. They're not good people to be around. If you were talking about me, if you're talking about them, yeah, that's the whole group. The insecurity, that's the whole group that I'm talking about. They can't sit in a room by themselves and enjoy their own company. I mean, there are people that can, but for the most part, they cannot. You're not going to dogpile me. You're not going to You're not gonna beach of Normandy. You're not going to talk to me from a distance in a tone. And have two different meanings. I'm not going to do that all day. We're not. Mentally, we're not going to do that. It's like, uh, a man and a woman. Okay, so all men, we were all created equally, right? Well, there are differences between a man and a woman. There, there is that same applies to the mind and the thought process. It needs to be. There's a lane. You can't separate that lane. Otherwise, your your brain is not able to function properly. It's kind of like a punch in the face as you're thinking but in your head. And then it leads to confusion because what are you talking about? Are you talking about this or are you talking about that? 
And then you have to clarify. Like, there's, it's <laughs> the mess that is created here. That might be situational. I, you get into the movie Cloud Atlas, if, which is kind of what we're doing here. The similarities between the two, but they're separate. That, uh, it, it, I'm not going to keep doing it. As you're going about your day, like you're taking stabs. Eric, are you eating? Are you really talking like that? It's not an eat block. You could write a book on that. But you, you, a five minute summary is not. Does not do that justice. Evil in, I think it really comes down to evil intent. The intent behind it. Now that I think about it. They're evil. They're just evil. They made a choice. It was a mistake. They got put in their place. And now they want to cry about it. And not take responsibility for their own actions. I take responsibility for my actions. Other people do not do that. That insecurity, like you were talking about. They can't sit in a room and think about their own problems. Which would now deter us from adopting the proposed constitution. And which, not content with having conducted us to the brink of a precipice, seem resolved to plunge us into the abyss that awaits us below. Here, my countrymen, impelled by every motive that ought to influence an enlightened people, let us make a firm stand for our safety, our tranquility, our dignity, our reputation. Let us at last break the fatal charm which has too long seduced us from the paths of felicity and prosperity. Our reputation. He's talking about the, uh, the pot charge. Slavery. It's slavery. What you did there was you enslaved me before I was even born, and it was aimed specifically at me. It was slavery. You, for no re it's your attitude. You're the one that gets violent. You're the one that gets mad about it. You're the one oppressing people. I'm minding my own business. It's slavery. You can't apply that to other drugs. It's na it's pot's natural. It's a natural occurrence. Cocaine's not. Me. Meth is not. There's a process behind it. Oh, it's like poison. I'm talking JD nuts. They don't, they refuse to take responsibility for the, the mistake that they made. I don't know what else to tell them. They can't sit in a room by themselves. Now there are people that will like that I've I've been around that I, I care about that. The other people around them ruin it for them. The bad apples, they ruin it for those people that I care about. into other people's homes where you don't belong. It's not okay to do that. It's one thing to gather analytics and like make the product better, but you're you're invading. Overshield available. 
whenever I eat a banana and then the next person I play is a banana on the game and there's no camera on me, there's no connection, there's a problem with that. That's just invasion. I'm not arguing about it. I'm the founding father. They've already agreed. They've already given me permission. I'm not arguing about it. They can see everything you're doing. The spirit, as they just said. I'm not dealing with a, a, a group of uh, misfits. Who were never, I, maybe they were never disciplined, maybe they were disciplined too hard. I don't, I don't know. Bambi generation. that when I said now I mean now I still don't see it I'm not coming after you you can knock on the door big old wad of cash right, ladies that applies to you as well Halfway to victory. it's not a joke I'm not kidding with you I meant now definitely we're not insecure at all we're not shy So right now, this generation, they were trying to interpret your words without Power telling me. Inbound. They were trying to keep it a secret. Well, the cat's out the bag. Power items on the field. They were trying to interpret the spirit without acknowledging me. And now that they realize what the spirit is and what, they, what it meant, they don't like it. They, they made a mistake, and they don't want to own up to it. That's all it comes down to, greed. The status, the bling. They want to look shiny. There's no whistle blowing. 
Joe, you had the right to remain silent. Oh, I'm and this is getting from the team get rid of you. I'm not kidding with you. You broke the law. Accept it. Whether you like it or not, I will do something about it. I'm, we're talking about murder, genocide with your technology. My life is not your trade secret. You do not own me. I own you. Do you understand me? I will kill you. I'm, I'm not kidding with you at all, Connor. You fucked up that bad. You're corrupt. You're more than corrupt. I hope that billion dollars is worth it, because I can drop a bomb on you in a second. I could shake that earth in a fucking second if you want me to. I hope that billion dollars is worth it. Isn't that what you work for? That billion dollars? Isn't that why you have it? So you can do those things? Drop those bombs? I promise you, I will kill you. Overshield available. I'm not picking up your shit. You are not a part of this. You are not on my team. I don't want you around. You're not welcome here. You have the right to remain silent. Give me my fucking money now. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna stick it out, like, 45 kills, I'm gonna quit. It is true, as has been before observed, that facts too stubborn to be resisted have produced a species of general assent to the abstract proposition that there exist material defects in our national system. But the usefulness of the concession on the part of the old adversaries of federal measures is destroyed by a strenuous opposition to a remedy upon the only principles that can give it a chance of success. While they admit that the government of the United States is destitute of energy, they contend against conferring upon it those powers which are requisite to supply that energy. They seem still to aim at things repugnant and irreconcilable, at an augmentation of federal authority without a diminution of state authority, at sovereignty in the Union and at complete independence in the members. They still, in fine, seem to cherish with blind devotion the political monster of an imperium in imperio. This renders a full display of the principal defects of the Confederation necessary. Uh, nowadays, they're putting too much emphasis on foreign policy. Uh, that's all it is in the news, foreign policy. That is it. Which tells me there are outside sources coming in. in order to show that the evils we experience do not proceed from minute or partial imperfections, but from fundamental errors in the structure of the building, which cannot be amended otherwise than by an alteration in the first principles and main pillars of the fabric. The great and radical vice in the construction of the existing confederation is in the principle of legislation for states or governments in their corporate or collective capacities and as contradistinguished from the individuals of which they consist. Though this principle does not run through all the powers delegated to the Union, yet it pervades and governs those on which the efficiency of the rest depends. Except as to the rule of appointment, the United States has an indefinite discretion to make requisitions for men and money, but they have no authority to raise either by regulations extending to the individual citizens of America. The consequence of this is that though in theory their resolutions concerning those objects are laws, 
constitutionally binding on members of the union. You're, you're bound. Officer, you have the right to remain silent. We don't. We can change it. We can press the laws. We 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 can change it. How am I in the past right now? How did I get there? Shut up. I need to uh, join the crowd. The officers have the right to remain silent. That that guy who just passed torturing me with his vehicle has the right to remain silent. Get off my land. I'm not kidding with you. You're not welcome here. Don't don't get on that bike. It ain't yours. Intent. Yet in practice, they are mere recommendations which the states observe or disregard at their option. It is a singular instance of the capriciousness of the human mind that after all the admonitions we have had from experience on this head, there should still be found men who object to the new constitution, for deviating from a principle which has been found the bane of the old, and which is in itself evidently incompatible with the idea of government, a principle in short which, if it is to be executed at all, must substitute the violent and sanguinary agency of the sword to the mild influence of the magistracy. You're violent, officer. There is nothing absurd or impracticable in the idea of a league or alliance between independent nations for certain defined purposes precisely stated in a treaty regulating all the details of time, place, circumstance, and united quantity, nations. leaving nothing to future discretion, and depending for its execution on the good faith of the parties. Compacts of this kind exist among all civilized nations, subject to the usual vicissitudes of peace and war, of observance and non-observance, as the interests or passions of the contracting powers dictate. In the early part of the present century, there was an epidemical rage in Europe for this species of compacts, from which the politicians of the times fondly hoped for benefits which were never realized. With a view to establishing the equilibrium of power and the peace of that part of the world, all the resources of negotiation were exhausted, and triple and quadruple alliances were formed. But they were scarcely formed before they were broken, giving an instructive but afflicting lesson to mankind how little dependence is to be placed on treaties which have no other sanction than the obligations of good faith. Good faith. I'm going to stop you right there. I'm glad you said that. You don't have to telephone. Alexander Bell, and that one, the one who invented it, the cup. You're 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 making the alliance. Like you guys are getting, you guys are having a party, getting drunk together, making an alliance, and then you leave, and you have no way to communicate, and it takes like a month to to reach the Pony Express. You know what I mean? And which oppose general considerations hard, of peace and justice sense. to the impulse of sense. any immediate interest or passion. If the particular states in this country are disposed to stand in a similar relation to each other and to drop the project of a general discretionary superintendence, the scheme would indeed be pernicious 
and would entail upon us all the mischiefs which have been enumerated under the first head. But it would have the merit of being at no. least consistent and practicable, abandoning all views towards a confederate government. This would bring us to a simple alliance, offensive and defensive, and would place us in a situation to be alternate friends and enemies of each other, as our mutual jealousies and rivalships nourished by the intrigues of foreign nations should prescribe to us. But if we are unwilling to be placed in this perilous situation, if we still will adhere to the design of a national government, or, which is the same thing, of a superintending power under the direction of a common council, we must resolve to incorporate into our plan those ingredients which may be considered, considered as forming the characteristic difference between a league and a government. We must extend the authority of the union to the persons of the citizens, the only proper objects of government. Government implies the power of making laws. It is essential to the idea of a law that it be attended with a sanction, or in other words, a penalty or punishment for disobedience. If there be no penalty annexed to disobedience, the resolutions or commands which pretend to be laws will in fact amount to nothing more than advice or recommendation. This penalty, whatever it may be, can only be inflicted in two ways, by the agency of the courts and ministers of justice, or by military force, by the coercion of the magistracy, or by the coercion of arms. The first kind can evidently apply only to men. The last kind must of necessity be employed against bodies politic or communities or states. It is evident that there is no process of a court by which the observance of the laws can, in the last resort, be enforced. Sentences may be denounced against them for violations of their duty, but these sentences can only be carried into execution by the sword. In an association where the general authority is confined to the collective bodies of the communities that compose it, every breach of the laws must involve a state of war, and military execution must become the only instrument of civil obedience. Such a state of things can certainly not deserve the name of government nor would any prudent man choose to commit his happiness to it. There was a time when we were told that breaches by the states of the regulations of the federal authority were not to be expected, that a sense of common interest would preside over the conduct of the respective members and would beget a full compliance with all the constitutional requisitions of the Union. This language, at the present day, would appear as wild as a great part of what we now hear from the same quarter will be thought when we shall have received further lessons from that best oracle of wisdom, experience. It at all times betrayed an ignorance of the true springs by which human conduct is actuated, and belied the original inducements to the establishment of civil power. Why has government been instituted at all? Because the passions of men will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint, has it been found that bodies of men act with more rectitude or greater disinterestedness than individuals? The contrary of this has been inferred by all accurate observers of the conduct of mankind, and the inference is founded upon obvious reasons. Regard to reputation has a less active influence when the infamy of a bad action is to be divided among a number than when it is to fall singly upon one. A spirit of faction which is apt to mingle its poison in the deliberation of all bodies of men, will often hurry the persons of whom they are composed into improprieties and excesses, from which they would blush in a private capacity. In addition to all this, there is, in the nature of sovereign power, an impatience of control that disposes those who are invested with the exercise of it to look with an evil eye upon all external attempts to restrain or direct its operations. From this spirit it happens that in every political association which is formed upon the principle of uniting in a common interest a number of lesser sovereignties, there will be found a kind of eccentric tendency in the subordinate or inferior orbs by the operation of which there will be a perpetual effort in each to fly off from the common center. This tendency is not difficult to be accounted for. It has its origin in the love of power. Power controlled or abridged is almost always the rival and enemy of that power by which it is controlled or abridged. 
This simple proposition will teach us how little reason there is to expect that the persons entrusted with the administration of the affairs of the particular members of a confederacy will at all times be ready, with perfect good humor and an unbiased regard to the public weal, to execute the resolutions or decrees of the general authority. The reverse of this results from the constitution of human nature. If, therefore, the measures of the Confederacy cannot be executed without the intervention of the particular administrations, there will be little prospect of their being executed at all. The rulers of the respective members, whether they have a constitutional right to do it or not, will undertake to judge of the propriety of the measures themselves. They will consider the conformity of the thing proposed or required to their immediate interests or aims, the momentary conveniences or inconveniences that would attend its adoption. All this will be done, and in a spirit of interested and suspicious scrutiny, without that knowledge of national circumstance and reasons of state, which is essential to a right judgment, and with that strong predilection in favor of local objects, which can hardly fail to mislead the decision. The same process must be repeated in every member of which the body is constituted, and the execution of the plans framed by the councils of the whole will always fluctuate on the discretion of the ill-informed and prejudiced opinion of every part. Those who have been conversant in the proceedings of popular assemblies, who have seen how difficult it often is, where there is no exterior pressure of circumstances to bring them to harmonious resolutions on important points, will readily conceive how impossible it must be to induce a number of such assemblies deliberating at a distance from each other at different times and under different impressions long to cooperate in the same views and pursuits. In our case, the concurrence of thirteen distinct sovereign wills is requisite under the Confederation to the complete execution of every important measure that proceeds from the Union. It has happened as was to have been foreseen. The measures of the Union have not been executed. The delinquencies of the States have, step by step, matured themselves to an extreme, which has, at length, arrested all the wheels of the national government and brought them to an awful stand. Congress at this time scarcely possess the means of keeping up the forms of administration till the states can have time to agree upon a more substantial substitute for the present shadow of a federal government. Things did not come to this desperate extremity at once. The causes which have been specified produced at first only unequal and disproportionate degrees of compliance with the requisitions of the Union. The greater deficiencies of some states furnished the pretext of example and the temptation of interest to the complying or to the least delinquent states. Why should we do more in proportion than those who are embarked with us in the same political voyage? Why should we consent to bear more than our proper share of the common burden? These were suggestions which human selfishness could not withstand, and which even speculative men, who looked forward to remote consequences, could not without hesitation combat. Each state, yielding to the persuasive voice of immediate interest or convenience, has successively withdrawn its support, till the frail and tottering edifice seems ready to fall upon our heads and to crush us beneath its ruins. End of Federalist Number 15 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scott Mather, Recording. You guys are about spreading the wealth. You mean when once it all for itself, uh... The mother country, if, as other countries follow suit, yeah, they they want it. The king wants it all for himself. You guys are trying to spread the wealth and uh, make it the group effort. Probably the king at some point or queen at some point said something that was just outright stupid. Maybe you couldn't. Um, well, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Uh, you couldn't prove himself in your eyes. And so that's, that's where your hostility comes. You're just as smart as the king or queen is. What's the point of listening to that person?
So like I said, such an example. Yeah, take the money away from that, and then and then their job is to set the example for the uh, the root. You know what I mean? So other people can follow suit as far as how to behave in morals. The king of kings, right? Keeping their composure. I'll be right back.
living up to those expectations. James Madison. You seem to be uh, a popular guy on these Federalist Papers. Joe, you have the right to remain silent. I'm not kidding with you. They said it a hundred times. Shut up. Alexander Bell and that George. I see you, George. Well, he's the one getting Alexander Hamilton is the one getting credit for it. That was the one on the uh, Spotify that said that's what we're going with. It has been declared. <laughs> James, it has been declared. No, I'm kidding. This is why we're looking it up. I specifically like how they put the twinkle in their eye when there's no camera. You guys ever notice that? You see the twinkle in his eye? I'm, I'm looking at the uh, James Madison picture from the White House. The, the little white in his eye, the twinkle. There's no camera. A camera would pretty much a light bulb. Maybe I would have to take a picture with a candle lit, but that doesn't seem... Some guys need to do some research on these inventions when they were invented. It's a very serious man. Carson City, go to Carson City. The coin, you know what it is?
go ahead and continue this and then see what he has to say about himself. The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 16 by Alexander Hamilton. Is the same subject continued. Up and down, which is like it's telling me yes or no. Is there a reason your computer system's doing it? As I say that, you're vibrating my eyes to portray your emotions. I don't care about your emotions. I don't care about you at all. Generation of this time, I don't care. Quit shaking the fucking screen. The next step. I've already been given permission to kill you. Period. It's not bigger than me. My name is written in the goddamn land. It is not bigger than me. You're basically trying to argue that the, head, that the uh, original Congress has no value here. What you're trying to argue. Cool. Are you done? It makes me want to beat your ass, honestly, whenever I see that. You crying in front of me? It makes me want to beat your ass. Like, I'm being serious. Shut the fuck up. Give me my fucking money. Now. Oh, he just opened his door, didn't even go to the bathroom? Really? I wonder why. Did you leave for a reason? Am I getting antsy on you? I, I, you have the right to remain silent. I don't know why you think otherwise. It's already been established. It's already been decided. It's already in the law books. There is no interpretation other than mine. Ours. You, you hear? <laughs> like they insured it. How did I get back there? How am I in the past? That's the argument. Oh, the Zodiac. Yeah, I, I, I caught the Zodiac killer. Yeah. Definitely. Sterling Silver, huh? Old Carson City. You, you still have the right to remain silent, and I still could kill you right now, legally. You're not getting out of it. There's a reason for everything. Okay? It's not the groups. It was premeditated. <laughs> You're not getting out of it. The land says my name on it. Silver Dollar City. CDS. Backward. It's premeditated. You deserved it. I have nothing to say to you. You earned it. <laughs> Regardless, you have the right to remain silent. I will kill you.
All I have to do is look at it, and all of a sudden it's yours? No. I don't care about that. Like, they're watching me do this, and they're still saying it. Don't waste your time. Is the insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve the Union. From the New York Packet, Tuesday, December 4, 1787. Hey, Hamilton. To the silence. people of the state of New York. Musk, I'm not kidding with you. Shut the fuck up. The tendency of the principle of legislation for states or communities in their political capacities, the as it has been exemplified by the experiment we have made of it, is equally attested the by the events step. which have befallen yeah, all other governments of the Confederate kind, of which we have any account, in exact proportion to its prevalence in those systems. The confirmations of this fact will be worthy of a distinct and particular examination. I shall content myself with barely observing here the, uh, that of all the confederacies of antiquity which history has handed down to us, the Lycian and Achaean leagues, as far as there remain vestiges of them, appear to have been most free from the fetters of that mistaken principle, and were accordingly those which have best deserved, and have most liberally received, the applauding suffrages of political writers. This exceptionable principle may, as... So he keeps doing it. That's something... You have a mental disorder, bro. Poor choice. Incredibly poor choices. As they sit there and smile, they just smiling right in your face. Look at them. They are just, hi, guys. I'm a retard. Stop talking. They're not talking to you. They're not acknowledging you. Don't waste your time. It sounded like uh, something comes out of nowhere that nobody expects and puts you, puts you in your place and changes your mind to what it seemed like. So basically, the officers uh, defamed me that bad and, and tried doing the frame up that bad. Yes, they did. Uh, that bad. But I've, nobody's asked me about that, and it's not yours. Why are you talking about something that doesn't belong to you? The old squid game. So what they're doing, James, right there is uh, they're pissing you off and then coming in and making baby faces. It's illegal. Shh. Don't open your mouth. Don't talk. You should have thought about it. I don't know what to tell you. Not interested. Missouri defamed me and painted me in a bad light and ruined my reputation for no reason at all, Brett. The frame up. What do I have to do with Brett? I could kill you right now. I don't know why you think you're committing felonies. I don't know why you think you're, you're not, Perry. I'm not, Mike, I'm not kidding with you. You go down to Sykesville on that DEA fucking office. I will kill you. Just so you, just so we're clear here. You have the right to remain silent from the first Congress. You painted me in a bad light and you lied. You committed perjury.
a poor choice. Yeah, ladies, I mean what I say. Don't. I would. I would step away. I'm right here. We can hang out. You want to hang out? Let's hang out. I'm not kidding. And I mean everybody. No, I'm not interested in you, stupid cat. Um, no, you're not getting a search warrant. Any search warrant that's been signed is a uh, fraudulent. It's original. It's original. Truly as emphatically, be styled the parent of anarchy. It has been seen that delinquencies in the members of the Union are its natural and necessary offspring, and that whenever they happen, the only constitutional remedy is force, and the immediate effect of the use of it, civil war. It remains to inquire how far so odious an engine of government, in its application to us, would even be capable of answering its end. You if there should it. not be a large army constantly at the disposal of the national government, it would either not be able to employ force at all, or like now. when this could be done, it would amount to a war between parts of the Confederacy concerning the infractions of a league, in which the strongest combination would be most likely to prevail, whether it consisted of those who supported or that. of those who resisted we're the general gonna, authority. We're reverse roles here. You can it would rarely that. happen I'll that the delinquency it. to be redressed would be confined to a single member and if there were more than one who had neglected their duty, similarity of situation would induce them to unite for common defense. Independent of this motive of sympathy, if a large and influential state should happen to be the aggressing member, it would commonly have weight enough with its neighbors to win over some of them as associates to its cause. Specious arguments of danger to the common liberty could easily be contrived. Plausible excuses for the deficiencies of the party could, without difficulty, be invented, to alarm the apprehensions, inflame the passions, and conciliate the goodwill, uh, even of those nah. states 
which were not chargeable with any violation or omission of duty. This would be the more likely to take place, as the delinquencies of the larger members might be expected sometimes to proceed from an ambitious premeditation in their rulers, with a view to getting rid of all external control upon their designs of personal aggrandizement, the better to effect which it is presumable they would tamper beforehand with leaving individuals in the tamper, adjacent states. Tampered with it. If associates could not be found at home, recourse would be had to the aid of foreign powers, who would seldom be disinclined to encouraging the dissensions of a confederacy from the firm union of which they had so much to fear. When the sword is once drawn, the passions of men observe no bounds of moderation. The suggestions of wounded pride, the instigations of irritated resentment, would be apt to carry the states against which the arms of the Union were exerted, to any extremes necessary to avenge the affront or to avoid the disgrace of submission. The first war of this kind would probably terminate in a dissolution of the Union. This may be considered as the violent death of the Confederacy. Its more natural death is what we now seem to be on the point of experiencing, if the federal system be not speedily renovated in a more substantial form. It is not probable, considering the genius of this country, that the complying states would often be inclined to support the authority of the Union by engaging in a war against the non-complying states. They would always be more ready to pursue the milder course of putting themselves upon an equal footing with the delinquent members by an imitation of their example. And the guilt of He's all would Twitch. thus become the security of all. Our past experience has exhibited the operation YouTube, of this spirit any, in its full light. Source, like in there would, in fact, be an insuperable difficulty in ascertaining when force could, with propriety, anything. be employed. No in the article of pecuniary contribution, which would be it's the most usual source of delinquency, it would often be impossible to decide whether it had proceeded from disinclination or inability. The pretense of the latter would always be at hand, and the case must be very flagrant in which its fallacy could be detected with flagrant, sufficient certainty yeah. to justify the harsh expedient of compulsion. Yeah, yeah, it is easy to see that this problem alone, as often as it should occur, would open a wide field for the exercise of factious views of partiality and of oppression in the majority that happened to prevail in the National Council. It, it, hate, it seems to require okay, no pains to, to prove that the states ought not to prefer a national constitution which could only be kept in motion by the instrumentality of a large army continually on foot to execute the ordinary requisitions or decrees of the government. And yet, this is the plain alternative killer? involved by those who wish to deny it the power of extending its operations to individuals. Such a scheme, if practicable at all, would instantly degenerate into a military despotism. But it will be found in every light impracticable. The resources of the Union would not be equal to the maintenance of an army considerable enough to confine the larger states within the limits of their duty, nor would the means ever be furnished of forming such an army in the first instance. Whoever considers the populousness and strength of several of these states singly at the present juncture and looks forward to what they will become, even at the distance of half a century, will at once dismiss as idle and visionary any scheme which aims at regulating their movements by laws to operate upon them in their collective capacities and to be executed by a coercion applicable to them in the same capacities. A project of this kind is little less romantic than the monster-taming yeah. spirit which Thanks is attributed to the fabulous heroes and demigods of antiquity. Even in those confederacies which have been composed of members smaller than many of our I'm gonna stop you right there, what you just said. That's amazing. Yeah, it's not very romantic. It's it's hatred. Um somewhere along the line you start getting into the pronunciation pronunciation of uh, of certain words and the roll of the tongue. Uh that's the that's the difference. That, that took some thought. It, it's not elegant. It's it's choppy. It 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 makes you feel unintelligent. It has that unintelligent feel to it.
I, I remember there was a time like you said, cunt, and all the women, like, don't you ever say that again. First of all, what does that even mean? <laughs> Is that a joke? I'll say it as much as I want. Do I like it? No. See, there's a difference right there, the crispness. That's the mic. You can hear it in the mic as well. It, uh... It's almost like it's auto-locking prior, and then it stops auto-locking. But it's, I, I don't have that on. And I'm using a mouse and keyboard. That's, that's almost what it's like. But you can hear it in the mic. The mic will get louder and a, a little bit more crisper. Jebby, Jeb, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you. I don't care about the states. You're, you're felons at this point. That's felony charges, boys, and all of you. I mean it. You're not welcome here at all. You're enemies of the uh, country. You're spies. Get get lost. You're not welcome here. I'm the, I'm the one entrusted to it. I'm telling you, you're 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 frauds. You're corrupt. It's it's self interest. Get lost. I don't need you. See right there, see it, it's almost like it locks on. Even when you're closer. You see it? Five minutes it's definitely the microphone. I'm sure it's a mixture of things, that's not just it, but if you uh if you tilt the microphone up or down, it'll change the uh emotions. You can feel it. The cup head, you can definitely feel it. As I say that, like I can feel it on my chest lifting off of me. Very nice. Enemy there. Makes me wonder about elephants and their musks. Now that could be heat. That could be the heat. Maybe that's what you're doing. Uh, lower level of heat. Cause it's all it's all sound is what it is. After that shot, everything went downhill from there, didn't it? Didn't it? I didn't mean to kill you there. I didn't mean to kill you there. That's my fault. That was a that was like a hell marionade too. Tease. The principle of legislation for sovereign states, supported by military coercion, has never been found effectual. It has rarely been attempted to be employed, but against the weaker members, and in most instances attempts to coerce the refractory and disobedient, have been the signals of bloody wars, in which one half of the Confederacy has displayed its banners against the other half. 
that'll get you. The result of these observations to an intelligent mind must be clearly this that if it be possible at any rate to construct a federal government capable of regulating the common concerns and preserving the general tranquility, it must be founded as to the objects committed to its care. I'm going to stop you right there. So what's going on is we've mentioned this before with uh, Thomas Paine, uh, the conquering. The land has been conquered. So basically at this point, um, there's nothing left to conquer other than the mind. So that's what they've moved on to is the mind, uh, the manipulation through the businesses. Um, they've pretty much consolidated all the sources for their own desires. And now they're taking that and, and, and figuring out how the customer reacts and then molding the customer to their liking is what's going on. Um, uh, Basically, the business is owning the customer, is what it's turning into. Uh, furthermore, with consolidating all the sources, it's harder to do business on top of uh, molding the customer to their liking. Um, you're limited on where you can go to get that product. Uh, there's, there's, there's <laughs> it's to the point like you're on the edge of a monopoly where there's just enough to say that it's not a monopoly, but there's not enough to go start your own business. It's a, it's a tease. On top of that, the taxes, they're basically taking half of the money from the business that's making that money and, uh, and claiming it for themselves for whatever reason, even though, even though the land has been conquered. Um... Furthermore, they're using those taxes on the military to uh, over-encumber the citizens to where the military is now in charge. The bombs. They can fly overhead and, and shoot us down for no reason at all. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like mass crowds. And if, if they were to do that, and if the citizens were to stand up and try to fight the military base, they would, they would have to be in a group. This is where I was, Israel, I've said this before, like, to the, uh, the, to it, the Islamists spread out. The dude is literally has a bola. He's swinging a bola with a rock, and they're dropping million-dollar bombs on one person. I'm more than angry. Um... Uh, I would disband the Air Force. I would disband the missile. I would I would completely destroy all the missiles and in, in every country. Like you're doing hand to hand combat or you're not doing combat. That's what it's become. Uh, they're over encumbering the citizens and the citizens can't stand up for themselves. On top of that, they're 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 uh, the mental disorders. They're uh, discombobulating the mind, if you will, to where the citizens can't think for themselves. They're, they're pretty much helpless, starting to become helpless. They're working towards that transition, uh, especially if you start getting into technology like holograms and stuff. Uh, it's only going to get worse. Yeah, I've uh, on a personal level, I've made it very clear what the problem is. Uh, nothing's being done about the problem. Uh, you've made a, a dependence on the problem. Where if you take away take that away, you can't function. And furthermore, whenever I, I point out the problem, I get attacked for pointing out the problem. Handicap. I told you what the deal is. I told you why it's happening. I told you the reason. We exactly pinpointed it where you need to go and what you need to do to get rid of it. Don't get mad at me. We are all created equally, and they're trying to disprove that. This is like the English, whatever empire it is. Oh, as I say that, my lungs get hit with the mic. Nobody's scared of you, man. I, I was just given permission to kill you. Hands down, no questions asked. Wow.
Wagner. You wagging me now, Poland? Is that where it's starting at, Poland? Belarus. Is it the Wagner group? Is that where it is? Are you sure that's not Nine Tails? I know if Norway, if you ever use that uh, spiral ever again, I will nuke you. I will, I will demolish your country. I'm not kidding with you. If you, if I ever see that again, no questions asked, you will be dead. Real. Do you see though? Do you see what we can do? Too much power. While I have protection, while I'm not going to be touched, other people do not have that luxury. So. Upon the reverse of the principle contended for by the opponents of the proposed Constitution, it must carry its agency to the persons of the citizens. It must stand in need of no intermediate legislations but must itself be empowered to employ the arm of the ordinary magistrate to execute its own resolutions. The majesty of the national authority must be manifested through the medium of the courts of justice. The government of the Union, like that of each state, must be able to address itself immediately to the hopes and fears of individuals, and to attract to its support those passions which have the strongest influence upon the human heart. It must, in short, possess all the means and, other and have spiral, a right to resort no to hate. all the methods no, of executing right. the powers no, with which again. it is entrusted that are possessed and exercised by the government of the particular states. To this reasoning, it may perhaps be objected that if any state should be disaffected to the authority of the Union, it could at any time obstruct the execution of its laws and bring the matter to the same issue of force with the necessity of which the opposite scheme is reproached. The possibility of this objection will vanish the moment we advert to the essential difference between a mere non-compliance and a direct and active Joe. resistance. <laughs> yeah, if the interposition of the state legislatures be necessary to give effect to a measure of the Union, they have only not to act or to act evasively, and the measure is defeated. This neglect of duty may be disguised under affected but unsubstantial provisions, so as not to appear, and of course not to excite any alarm, in the people, for the safety of the Constitution. The state leaders may even make a merit of their surreptitious invasions of it on the ground of some temporary convenience, exemption, or advantage. But if the execution of the uh, laws extinction. of the national government should not require the intervention of the state legislatures, if they were to pass the into sun. immediate operation <laughs> upon the citizens themselves, the particular governments could not interrupt their progress without an open and violent exertion of an unconstitutional power. No omissions nor evasions would answer the end. They would be obliged to act, and in such a manner as would leave no doubt that they had encroached on the national rights. An experiment of this nature would always be hazardous in the face of a constitution in any degree competent to its own defense, and of a people enlightened enough to distinguish between a legal exercise and an illegal yeah, usurpation of authority. I'll, I'll do what I want. The success of it would, would require not merely a factious majority in the legislature, but the concurrence of the courts of justice and of the body of the people. If the judges were not embarked in a conspiracy with the legislature, they would pronounce the resolutions of such a majority to be contrary to the support. You hear that, judges? Your co-conspirators. law of the land, unconstitutional and void. If the people were not tainted with the spirit of their state representatives, they, as the natural guardians of the Constitution, would throw their weight into the national scale and give it a decided preponderancy in the contest. Attempts of this kind would not often be made with levity or rashness because they could seldom be made without danger to the authors, unless in cases of a tyrannical exercise of the federal authority.
If opposition to the national government should arise from the disorderly conduct of refractory or seditious individuals, it could be overcome by the same means which are daily employed against the same evil under the state governments. The magistracy, being equally the ministers of the law of the land, from whatever source it might emanate, would doubtless be as ready to guard the national as the local regulations from the inroads of private licentiousness. As to those partial commotions and insurrections which sometimes disquiet society from the intrigues of an inconsiderable faction or from sudden or occasional ill humors that do not infect the great body of the community, the general government could command more extensive resources for the suppression of disturbances of that kind than would be in the power of any single member. And as to those mortal feuds which, in certain conjunctures, spread a conflagration through a whole nation or through a very large proportion of it, proceeding either from weighty causes of discontent given by the government or from the contagion of some violent popular paroxysm, they do not fall within any ordinary rules of calculation. When they happen, they commonly amount to revolutions and dismemberments of empire. No form of government can always either avoid or control them. It is in vain to hope to guard against events too mighty for human foresight or precaution. <laughs> yeah. And it would be idle to object to a government because it could not perform impossibilities. End of Federalist number 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Scott Mather. The Federalist Papers, Federalist Number 17 by Alexander Hamilton. The same subject continued, that is, the insufficiency of the present Confederation to preserve the Union. For the Independent Journal, Wednesday, December 5, 1787. I don't, I don't really Hamilton. You know to I mean? the people of the state of New York. An objection of a nature different from that which has been stated and answered in my last address may perhaps be likewise urged against the principle of legislation for the individual citizens of America. It may be said that it would tend to render the government of the Union too powerful and to enable it to absorb those residuary authorities which it might be judged proper to leave with the states for local purposes. Allowing the utmost latitude to the love of power which any reasonable man can acquire, I confess I am at a loss to discover what temptation the persons entrusted with the administration of the general government could ever feel to divest the states of the authorities of that description. The regulation of the mere domestic police of the state appears to me to hold out slender allurements to ambition. Domestic. Commerce, finance, negotiation, and war seem to comprehend all the objects which have charms for minds governed by that passion and all the powers necessary to those objects ought, in the first instance, to be lodged in the national depository. The administration of private justice between the citizens of the same state, the supervision of agriculture, and of other concerns of a similar nature, all those things, in short, which are proper to be provided for by local legislation, can never be desirable cares of a general jurisdiction. It is therefore improbable that there should exist a disposition in the federal councils to usurp the powers with which they are connected, because the attempt to exercise those powers would be as troublesome as it would be nugatory, and the possession of them for that reason would contribute nothing to the dignity, to the importance, or to the splendor of the national government. But let it be admitted, for argument's okay, sake, buddy. that mere wantonness and lust of domination would be sufficient to beget that disposition. Still, that it may be safely affirmed that the sense of the constituent body of the national representatives, or in other words, okay, I don't want that. I don't want you. No, you're not going to do that. To clarify, lust for domination. Um, the sun. I don't want a sun get stuck up in the sky that doesn't belong there. You see where I'm going with that? Don't ever do that again. There is no lust for domination. It's not a question. Like, I don't need to go conquer anything. It was in my backyard. I've seen it more than once. It arrives on time. <laughs> I'm playing Halo with the boys, with the girls. What do you mean? I'm, we're, we're hanging out. It's not a problem. The people of the several states would control the indulgence of so extravagant an appetite. 
it will always be far more easy for the state governments to encroach upon the national authorities than for the national government to encroach upon the state authorities. The proof of this proposition turns upon the greater degree of influence which the state governments, if they administer their affairs with uprightness and prudence, will generally possess over the people, a circumstance which at the same time teaches us that there is an inherent and intrinsic weakness in all federal constitutions, and that too much pains cannot be taken in their organization to give them all the force which is compatible with the principles of liberty. The superiority of influence in favor of the particular governments would result partly from the diffusive construction of the national government, but chiefly from the nature of the objects to which the attention of the state administrations would be directed. It is a known fact in human nature that its affections are commonly weak in proportion to the distance or diffusiveness of the object. Upon the same principle that a man is more attached to his family than to his neighborhood, to his neighborhood than to the community at large, the people of each state would be apt to feel a stronger bias towards their local governments than toward the government of the Union, unless the force of that principle should be destroyed by a much better administration of the latter. This strong propensity of the human heart would find powerful auxiliaries in the objects of state regulation. The variety of more minute interests, which will necessarily fall under the superintendence of the local administrations, and which will form so many rivulets of influence running local. through every part of the society, cannot be particularized without involving a detail too tedious and uninteresting to com compensate for the instruction it might afford. There is one transcendent advantage belonging to the province of the state governments, which alone suffices to place the matter in a clear and satisfactory light. I mean the ordinary administration of criminal and civil justice. This, of all others, is the most powerful, most universal, and most attractive source of popular obedience and attachment. It is that which, being the immediate and visible guardian of life and property, having its benefits and its terrors in constant activity before the public eye, regulating all those personal interests and familiar concerns to which the sensibility of individuals is more immediately awake, contributes, more than any other circumstance, to impressing upon the minds of the people affection, esteem, and reverence toward the government. This great cement of society, which will diffuse itself almost wholly through the channels of the particular governments, independent of all other causes of influence, would ensure them so decided an empire over their respective citizens as to render them at all times a complete counterpoise and not unfrequently dangerous rivals to the power of the Union. The operations of the national government, on the other hand, falling less immediately under the observation of the mass of the citizens, the benefits derived from it will chiefly be perceived and attended to by speculative men. Relating to more general interests, they will be less apt to come home to the feelings of the people, and, in proportion, less likely to inspire an habitual sense of obligation and an active sentiment of attachment. The reasoning on this head has been abundantly exemplified by the experience of all federal constitutions with which we are acquainted, and of all others which have borne the least analogy to them. So Though the ancient wrong. feudal systems were not, strictly speaking, confederacies, yet they partook of the nature of that species of association. There was a common head, chieftain or sovereign, whose authority extended over the whole nation, and a number of subordinate vassals or feudatories who had large portions of land allotted to them, and numerous trains of inferior vassals or retainers who occupied and cultivated the land upon the tenure of fealty or obedience to the persons of whom they held it. Each principal vassal was a kind of sovereign within his particular domains. The consequences of this situation were a continual opposition to authority of the sovereign, and frequent wars between the great barons or chief feudatories themselves. The power of the head of the nation was commonly too weak, either to preserve the public peace, or to protect the people against the oppressions of their immediate lords. This period of European affairs is emphatically styled by historians the times of feudal anarchy. When the sovereign happened to be a man of vigorous and warlike temper, and of superior abilities, he would acquire a personal weight and influence which answered for the time the purpose of a more regular authority. But in general, the power of the barons triumphed over that of the prince, and in many instances his dominion was entirely thrown off, and the great fiefs were erected into independent principalities or states. In those instances in which the monarch finally prevailed over his vassals, his success was chiefly owing to the tyranny of those vassals over their dependents. The barons, or nobles, 
equally the enemies of the sovereign and the oppressors of the common people, were dreaded and detested by both, till mutual danger and mutual interest effected a union between them fatal to the power of the aristocracy. Had the nobles, by a conduct of clemency and justice, preserved the fidelity and devotion of their retainers and followers, the contest between them and the prince must almost always have ended in their favor. And in the abridgment... I'm going to stop you right there. We may, we may be taking a break because the, uh, the Twitch is starting to lag. Yeah, they're, uh, they're in denial right now. Hey, you have the right to remain silent, Mac. I'm not kidding with you. Shut the fuck up. Stop it where it is. 